any other doctor, not Dr. McDougal. Yeah. <laughs> Happy President's Day, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. We are so honored and thrilled to have Dr. John McDougall as a guest today, later on to be joined by his wife, Mary, because he's going to be giving a brand new lecture on a very important topic that I know you have many questions about because you wrote in your questions to ask Dr. McDougall, and that is the subject of autoimmune disease. Please welcome Dr. McDougall to the show. It's so nice to see you, and I love your shirt. It's my favorite color. Thank you. You know, I, I've uh, my favorite colors are purple and orange, and I, I had quite a few of my windsurfing boards made of purple and orange. You know, at least they noticed me. Maybe they could find me out there in the water if I got lost. But anyway, yeah, I like these colors too. Good. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me on. I, I certainly hope that people are not tiring of these lectures. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to put together some presentations for you that will give you my understanding of, of how you should be cared for. And I did that in terms of breast cancer. I did another one in terms of diabetes, another one in terms of heart disease. And today I'm going to do one in terms of uh, autoimmune diseases. And hopefully it'll turn out to be really simple as far as your understanding goes. There's some complex things that you have to get over, but I'll take you through those slowly. And then once you have the unifying concepts, then it'll all make sense to you. You'll understand why you need to fix your, the food, why you need to change your diet, how you can get well. You understand why uh, present day tests and treatments aren't working. You know, it's, it's, it's a sad situation, but once you understand the, the basic physiology, the basic metabolism, the basic science behind all of this, it just makes so much sense. You know, last time when we first started out, what I did is I talked to you about how the, uh, the rich Western diet changes your hormone levels, causes precocious puberty and a late menopause. I talked to you about that. And then I talked to you about breast cancer. I explained to you how breast cancer is uh, 10, year old, 10 years old in terms of its development. It's been doubling for 10 years by the time you can find it through screening, early detection, mammography, et cetera. And by that time, if it's a real cancer, which fortunately a lot of them aren't, if it's a real cancer, it's spread throughout the rest of the body. You've got to understand that basic concept of the natural growth of cancer to understand everything else. And I gave you a lecture a couple of weeks ago on heart disease. And I explained to you that it's not the old fibrous scars that kill. Those are the ones they operate on, but they're not the ones that kill. The ones that kill are the, are the, the hot, the volatile, the pimples on the inside of the arteries that, that burst open and kill. And I'm gonna try and give you a unifying concept in terms of autoimmune diseases too. And hopefully once you understand this, that'll all make sense to you as to why the present day approach doesn't work and uh, why you deserve better and why you deserve a cure. And there is a cure. So let's uh, get on to the discussion on autoimmune diseases. And we'll have time to answer some questions when we get done. All right, autoimmune diseases. Uh, if, if I were your doctor, and I had a chance to talk to you, you know, these are the things that I would like to say to you. And, you know, these are the things I'd hope your own doctor would tell you in terms of these various problems that so many people have. And the one we're gonna talk about is autoimmune diseases. You know, I've known about autoimmune diseases for, for a long time. And uh, I, I would say I probably learned about it in junior high, certainly in high school, I heard about autoimmune diseases. And what I remember is that the body attacks itself. Auto, auto, the, uh, the autoimmunity, the body attacks itself. And I kept thinking to myself, why, why would the body be so stupid as to attack itself? Well, let's see if we can figure out why the body would do that, why the body would attack itself. But there's uh, you know, some general concepts that I want you to understand. First of all, I want you to know this is a disease of the entire body, you know, all, all the way from your toenail beds to your hair follicles. It, it affects everything, your skin, your balls, your joints, every cell in your body is affected by what's going on here. 
And that's, of course, manifested in a whole slew of diseases that you thought maybe were unrelated, but they're all related. These are diseases where the body attacks itself, like Addison's disease, where the body attacks the adrenal glands, alopecia, where it attacks the hair follicles. Ankylosing spondylitis is a kind of arthritis. Crohn's disease affects the bowels. Dermatomyositis is like it sounds. It's attacking the skin and the muscles. Diabetes attacks the pancreas. Inflammatory arthritis attacks the joints, et cetera. Lupus attacks the joints. Multiple sclerosis attacks the brain. Myasthenia gravis attacks the nerve end plates. End, end plates. Oh, I could go on. Let me go on. Pernicious anemia, that's where it attacks the stomach. Polymyositis, again, attacking the bones and the muscles. Psoriasis attacks the skin and the joints. And then you have psoriatic arthritis there, attacks the cartilage. And you have chondrochondritis attacks the uh, connective tissue, you have scleroderma, attacks the thyroid, and you get low thyroid, you get hypothyroidism. You've heard about it, you've heard of autoimmune thyroiditis, that's what the doctor tells you you have. Vitiligo, it attacks the pigment cells of your skin. Every, I just want you to think about this, this is going on every place in your body. And it's probably going, uh, uh, it's going on with everybody who eats the risk Western diet to a certain degree, it just hasn't gotten to the point where it's causing you disability and significant symptoms like pain that you seek out the doctor, but this is going on inside of you now. To understand what's going on as far as autoimmune disease, why would the body attack itself? Well, you gotta be patient with me on this particular slide. This is gonna be the difficult part of the lecture. The, the underlying concept that eventually you need to understand, and I will tell you it many, many times as we go through the lecture, you need to understand this basic concept as we eat food. But when we eat plant foods, they're different than animal foods. So you don't get this kind of autoimmune reaction with plant foods because we're not plants, we're animals. So when we eat animal foods, uh, be they secretions of animals such as dairy products or parts of animals such as their thyroid glands or their muscles, what happens is this food goes into the intestinal tract where it's supposed to be broken down by various enzyme systems is supposed to be broken down into individual components that are not troublesome at all. But sometimes indigestion is incomplete. And as a result, uh, intact proteins persist. And that's okay as long as they stay in the bowel, but they don't. What happens is people develop a leaky gut, which is the second phase that we're talking about here. And these intact proteins they go from the bowel into the bloodstream and they're not supposed to be in the bloodstream. You've got, you've got milk protein, you've got cow butt protein, you've got pig thyroid protein floating around your bloodstream now and the body thinks this is a virus or a bacteria or some kind of uh, invading organism. You know, cow and pig are not supposed to be inside your bloodstream. So the body makes antibodies against these foreign invaders. But the problem comes in in the fact that we have similar proteins on our various body tissues. And so the body appropriately makes, using its lymphocytes, white blood cells, it appropriately makes antibodies which attack the food protein. But these antibodies are not specific. They'll also attack similar proteins on your tissue parts, in your skin, in your pigment glands on your pancreas, in your joints. It's called molecular mimicry, molecular mimicry. Okay, to uh, produce a leaky gut, you can do it in a couple of ways. Uh, one way you can do it is you can damage the gut by consuming wheat, barley, and rye. And how often does that happen? Well, it may happen in a lot of people. Uh, there is uh, some research in my distant past that tells me that if you eat as much as two pounds of bread a day, uh, you'll get into a glut gluten challenge, you know, challenged by gluten proteins, significant enough to start changing the bowel and to start making it kind of leaky. But there are some people who are very sensitive to a leaky gut and the extreme of this is people who have celiac disease. Now, the other way that you can make the gut leaky is by, uh, by changing the microbiome. You've heard so much about this. These are the bacteria that live in your bowel. If you make them so wrong that the intestinal tract can't keep its integrity, 
because the wrong organisms are living in it. What happens is you develop a leaky gut. So you have uh, with, when it, with celiac disease, here's your normal intestinal border. You see all those spikes sticking up there? Uh, those spikes increase the digestive surface, surface of your bowel. Well, when you consume wheat, barley, and rye, uh, particularly in sensitive people, people who have a tendency towards celiac disease, what happens is this brush border, these spikes, they get knocked down and the gut becomes damaged and it becomes leaky. And as a result, the intact proteins can get through into the system. All kinds of diseases are associated with people who have celiac disease, like various autoimmune diseases, which we're gonna talk about during this entire lecture. I've listed all of these for you, but there are also non-autoimmune diseases that occur more frequently because you have all of this this foreign protein floating around your bloodstream. You get lymphomas and other kinds of cancers. You lose bone, you have problems with your teeth, you have anemias, infertility, all kinds of difficulties occur. This is a major blow to the system to have the gut not be any longer intact. These are the, uh, the changes that occur when uh, your bowel becomes leaky due to dysbiosis, which is the wrong bacteria growing in the bowel. It's animal proteins. And you can look up the kind of bacteria that grow in the bowel when you eat animal proteins. And uh, these are the ones that are unhealthy and they cause the intestinal tract to be leaky. When you eat agrarian or plant, agrarian type diet or plant-based or starch-based diet, then you grow healthy bacteria that keep the intestinal tract intact. Now, some interesting things I just want to tell you about your bowel is, is the microbes living in your intestine, your large intestine. This is just like eight feet of organ. You have 10 times more cells due to microbes, organisms, bacteria, viruses, 10 times more cells than are in your entire body. 150 times more genes. You have a thousand different species of little guys living in your intestinal tract. You can change your intestinal flora within 24 hours of changing your diet. And through a lifetime, 60 tons of food pass through that intestinal tract. Uh, I bet you always wanted to know that. Uh, consuming these animal foods causes another toxic reaction. It's due to uh, uh, the sulfur containing amino acids that you eat, which causes a dysbiosis. And this is related to the microbiome also, and that is when you eat sulfur containing foods. These would be your proteins. Uh, there are certain proteins uh, that contain amino acids that uh, are made up of sulfur compounds, like methionine is one of them. And if you look at the, uh, the amount of sulfur you consume, which is toxic to the intestinal tract is hydrogen sulfide, which causes this dysbiosis, which causes the gut to be leaky. You find that if you compare beef to pinto beans, same amount of calories, same amount of protein, you have four times more sulfur containing amino acids in beef than you do pinto beans. Eggs, four times more than corn. Cheddar cheese, five times more than white potatoes. And speaking of cheddar cheese, have you heard about cutting the cheese? Yeah, it's the, 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 the hydrogen sulfide that stinks so bad. It's the rotten egg smell. Chicken seven times more than rice and tuna 12 times more than sweet potatoes. So you create this dysbiosis. As a result, what happens is the lymphocytes, which is this big green guy here, it makes antibodies that go out and and attack the foreign proteins that come into the system. It, in its natural state, should be looking for viruses, bacteria, you know, prions. It should be looking for parasites. But in this case, what happens is just like a virus, just like a, a bacteria, foreign proteins get in by way of the food. And so the body ends up attacking these foreign proteins, like in the case of beef. The lymphocytes attack the beef protein, which ends up attacking you or cow's milk protein. It's looking for a foreign substance, a virus, et cetera. Well, it does find the virus. It does find the bacteria. It does find the beef protein. It does find the gluten. It does find the uh, casein that's found in milk protein. It does find these things and the lymphocytes make antibodies 
which are directed in this case towards cow protein, but also attack people. Mimicry is an evolved resemblance between an organism and another object, often an organism of another species. Molecular mimicry, it's called, you can look it up. Mimicry is copy. The body's looking for an invading substance and it finds you. Uh, let's take, for example, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, okay? Hashimoto, Hashimoto discovered this in the um, early 19th century. He was a Japanese scientist. So we call it Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Your doctor calls it autoimmune thyroiditis. It's where the body attacks itself. It attacks the thyroid gland. Now, why do you think the body would attack the thyroid gland? Well, maybe it gets, it becomes in contact with foreign thyroid glands. How do you come in contact with foreign thyroid glands? Well, when they slaughter the pig and the cow, you think they waste the thyroid glands? Of course not. They turn them into hot dogs, into sausages. So you end up eating these foreign thyroid glands, pig, cow, thyroid gland, and the body makes antibodies to these foreign thyroid glands. But the antibodies made are not so specific that they don't end up attacking your own thyroid tissue and you end up destroying your thyroid tissue. About 30, 40% of, of women in their 40s uh, develop thyroid conditions. It's, it's, it's quite common. Uh, another way that uh, these antibodies and proteins cause problems is by forming what we call antigen antibody complexes. Okay, you see these, uh, uh, th these large conglomerates of, of antibodies and you see the food protein and you see they form large aggregates. And these large aggregates, they get stuck in the vessel walls and they get stuck in small blood vessels, particularly in the kidneys and in the skin. And some of the manifestations of autoimmune diseases have to do with these, these complexes. Well, first thing I wanna establish for you, after I've established the fact that this affects your entire body, uh, there's not a space on the body that isn't, that is immune to being attacked by your own self. I want you to know that the diseases that we're talking about, the autoimmune diseases are, are confined primarily to developed countries where they eat the rich Western diet based upon animal foods, where they've given up their traditional starch-based diet. And so I'm gonna run through quickly some, uh, some maps for you. And what you would notice if you have the time to look at it, and maybe you'll go back and you'll look at this lecture and you'll see, you'll see the, the keys and you'll see the different uh, the different countries and the incidence of disease, but you'll have to have a little faith that I'm reading these correctly for you. You see, for example, meat consumption is high in developed countries like Europe, the United States, Canada, South America, Brazil, Argentina, biggest consumer of beef in the world is in Argentina. And of course, in Australia, you see milk consumption, a similar worldwide distribution. Okay, the animal products is what we're looking at. You'll see if you lay over the incidence of disease in these two patterns, consumption of meat and dairy, you'll find a direct correlation. Uh, the lighter red and orange ones are the ones that have most of the diseases of type one diabetes. And you see they're in the developed countries. Multiple sclerosis, again, in the developed countries. Lupus. Lupus. So lupus was unknown in Africa. Prior to 1960, there were no cases of lupus in Africa before 1960. In the United States, where we have a lot of people who have their origins distant from Africa, in other words, our African Americans are Blacks, they have the highest incidence of lupus of any subpopulation in the United States. So how did that happen? We went from a population where no lupus was described before 1960 to a different country where people eat a different diet and they have the highest incidence of lupus of any subpopulation. They didn't change their race. Uh, they didn't get, uh, they didn't you know, change their genetics. It just was, they changed their food, that's it. If you look at inflammatory bowel disease, you see the same thing. We're gonna be talking about these different conditions like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, hypothyroidism. I just talked to you about the thyroid gland. It's common where people eat a lot of pork, a lot of beef, they eat a lot of thyroid glands and chronic kidney disease. Likewise, it forms the same pattern. In other words, 
we're talking again about diseases of, of affluence, of, of Western living. That's what we're talking about. We could be talking about heart disease, breast cancer, et cetera, type two diabetes. But in this case, we're talking about autoimmune diseases following the same pattern. You should understand the underlying common denominator, which is the food. Schizophrenia, same type of relationship worldwide. It's common in countries that eat the rich Western diet. All right, let's take a look at one of these diseases. Let's take a look at uh, type one diabetes. This is also referred to as childhood diabetes. And this is the classic autoimmune disease. Well, we've known about this being an autoimmune disease for a half a century. And I don't know of any doctor who talks otherwise than why do you get type one diabetes where the ability of the pancreas to produce insulin is hampered or stopped completely the doctors will tell you it's the body attacking itself. It's an autoimmune disease. I don't know of any physician who talks otherwise. Everybody knows this. So what happens is in normal cells, you have uh, insulin receptors, which are kind of the Ys that you see sticking in the cells. You find the keys, which are insulin sticking in the cells in normal cells, you got plenty of insulin. And as a result, the blood sugar gets into the cells normally as they should, but in type one diabetes, you don't have any insulin. So even though you have normal receptors, the insulin is gone. And so the sugar can't get into the cells. We talked about this during the lecture on diabetes. I don't need to go through with it, with it in greater detail for you, except for you to understand is there little, there's little or no insulin in the body in type one diabetes because the pancreas has been injured and what happens is the body consumes foods. In this case, we're talking about milk. In this case, we're talking about the beta casein protein in milk. In this case, we're talking about the discovery back in 1992 that this was the culprit. What happens is by consuming milk products, you end up making antibodies, which not only attack the milk, but also attack the insulin producing cells of the pancreas. They're called the beta cells. And it takes about, uh, about three to seven years to destroy all the cells in the pancreas. And you have no more insulin producing cells in the pancreas. And then you have what we call type one diabetes. And we worked that out a long time ago, 1992. The 17 amino acids, which are similar between cow's milk protein and the surface cells of the pancreas. The 17 amino acids were discovered and this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1992. Everybody should know this. How about multiple sclerosis? Let's take a, little, a few minutes on this because I've spent a lot of my uh, career dealing with MS patients and we've done a study on multiple sclerosis. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of extra time on this autoimmune disease. Ah. One of my big interests in multiple sclerosis and my first love in life when I was about 11 years old was Annette Funicello. I'm like, come on, guys. If you're my age, you know you fell in love with Annette. Well, she died of multiple sclerosis in 2013. And that, I guess maybe that's part of the stimulus I have for being interested in multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, uh, this means multiple scars. You see here pictures of the brain. You see those little white blotches there, those are scars. That's what multiple sclerosis refers to as scars. What happens is the body attacks the nervous system. The nervous system gets inflamed, just like the arteries we talked about a few days ago, they get inflamed by the attack. And as a result, they develop inflammatory reactions which eventually end up in scar tissue. This is dead tissue, scar tissue is. And what you're looking at is old scars. But of course, the more old scars you have, the more likely it is you have severe brain damage. And where these scars occur, it's, it's a kind of a classic way of uh, diagnosing multiple sclerosis is these scars makes no sense at all. They occur randomly. Uh, just like if you were to put a blindfold on and take a gun with your eyes closed and shoot it at somebody, it would randomly knock out different areas of the body. Well, so it is with multiple sclerosis. There's, there's no prediction as to where the inflammation, the damage and the scar tissues will occur. So one day you may wake up blind 
the next day you wake up and you can't uh, work your bladder. And a few weeks later, you, the bowels don't work. And a little while later, one of your legs doesn't move. It's like a gunshot wound to your body, random. That's how you diagnose this disease. Well, if you follow the traditional Western diet, I have to tell you, you're not gonna do too well. And you know, many of my colleagues and neurologists I deal with, they don't like this information. And that's why I've provided for you six scientific papers. So you can look up whether or not my statement is true. And that is, even with the use of the most modern medications costing, I mean, just for the drug, $70,000 a year, the future prognosis is dismal with half of the patients afflicted with MS being unable to walk unassisted, bedridden, wheelchair bound or dead within 10 years. This is a serious disease. And there's no reason to believe that the modern medicines that you see advertised on cable news will change will change the day you die. They brag about changes in disability, but they're minor. Believe it, they're tiny and they're questionable, but that's their bragging rights these days is they change the disability score, but not in much by folks, not much. In other words, you ought to be darn right stimulated to learn what causes this disease and to deal with it. One of the explanations for why people get MS is because they don't have enough vitamin D. There have been research projects. There are doctors who treat people with multiple sclerosis with vitamin D. Where did they get that idea that vitamin D caused MS? Well, what you do is you look at the worldwide map and you find out where multiple sclerosis is common or where it's rare, where it's common is, is uh, at greater latitudes, where it's rare is around the equator. Well, around the equator, you have lots of sunshine. As you move north and south, the amount of sunshine decreases. And so therefore the vitamin D production decreases, right? That, that, that's, that's common. Changes sunlight, you expect that. But you know what, this correlation is not cause and effect. This is a confounding correlation because something else happens as you move away from the equator. What you do is you change your diet. The people around the equator still eat a plant food-based diet, a starch-based diets. And as they move away from the equator, they consume more animal foods, more dairy, more meat, et cetera. And you'll see this with heart disease and many other common problems that we have is people say, well, it's lack of vitamin D. They don't tell you to get more sunshine. They tell you to take vitamin D pills or shots and get lots of tests, which fits in well with the business. Uh, it's not due to sunshines, folks. All right, so to develop multiple sclerosis, you need to do one extra step. In addition to developing a leaky gut, remember the gut leaks and so intact proteins go through from the intestinal tract into the bloodstream, they leak through the gut wall, all right? And now you have, uh, you have uh, the foreign proteins floating around in the bloodstream. You have to get by one more barrier. The nervous system has an extra barrier and that barrier is called a blood brain barrier. So once the lymphocytes get activated and are making antibodies, what happens is they, they're confined to the circulatory system, they're confined to the blood vessel system and they have to get through what we call the blood brain barrier to get into the central nervous system where they can attack the myelin sheets of the nervous system and that's what happens. You attack the myelin sheets of the nervous system. Uh, Dr. Roy Swank, I wanna introduce you to him now. He's one of my mentors. And I knew Dr. Swank quite well. Personally, I knew him. He ran two programs at St. Lita Hospital with MS patients that were his. And the uh, St. Lita Hospital was uh, where I ran my, my program, the McDougall program for 16 years. So Dr. Swank ran a couple of programs with me at St. Lita Hospital. Dr. Swank and I had an official legal agreement for me to continue on with this work. And that's one of the reasons I'm really, really happy to present Dr. Swank to you as somebody who's dealt with one of the most serious autoimmune diseases, which should have made a bigger impression than he has. Dr. Swank, in a book that he wrote that I had a copy of in 1959, he knew, he knew the rich Western diet was the problem. He said, uh, gluttony and chronic degenerative diseases, you know, like heart disease and cancer and diabetes and so on, 
have been linked to the minds of both laymen and scientists for many years. The saying to dig your grave with your teeth probably has its origins in antiquity. But in the prosperous areas of the Western world during the past few decades, the maxim has taken on real and tragic meaning. 1959, I was, I was what, 14 years old at that time. Uh, Dr. Swank, uh, he took care of a lot of MS patients. He's uh, published uh, 176 papers and many of them have to do with diet and MS. Dr. Swank was the head of neurology at Oregon Health and Science University, the medical school in Portland for 23 years. You know, for many people around the world, they consider Dr. Swank the father of multiple sclerosis, certainly when it comes to diet and multiple sclerosis. Well, Dr. Swank, he demonstrated this uh, damage to the blood brain barrier. In other words, once you get the activated lymphocytes and once you get the antibodies produced in the bloodstream, they have to go through the blood brain barrier and get into the nervous system. And here he shows the, how this occurs. And he does it by, by taking and injecting little tiny microspheres into the blood vessel system. And you see how these little microspheres, they damage the, uh, the blood vessel. You can see the fluid leaking out into the brain tissue. This is the brain, okay? So you see the blood brain barrier being violated here. Because we became interested in fat in this disease, we started studying the effect of fat on the circulation. We were using dogs and humans and uh, hamsters at that time. And what we found was that uh, after three hours after a large butterfat meal, you find the red cells starting to clump up. And in the hamster, you could, where we studied the live circulation, you could watch the circulation slowing down and sometimes stopping for a period. And so we began to think in terms that this abnormality in the plasma, which we had become suspicious of being present, we began to think that there must be something in the, which is missing in MS, or which is abnormal in MS, which prevents this clumping, and that this clumping in MS is, causes damage to the capillary system of the brain. And this destroys what we know as a blood-brain barrier. And these are Dr. Swank's uh, photographs that he did in his laboratory. And you see the blood cells, they hit and they bounce off each other. That's before any kind of meal. And then what happens is this circumstance is uh, fat is fed. This happens to be an animal experiment. As fat is fed to this animal. And the fat coats the blood cells and causes them to aggregate into clumps and this aggregation and the low blood supply and the low amount of oxygen delivered to the tissues destroys the blood brain barrier. And that's an important component when it comes to developing multiple sclerosis because you need to get the attacking agents into the central nervous system floating around in the spinal fluid for you to do the damage. The blood flow finally returns about 10 to 12 hours later. You know, that's after a single high fat meal. And and we showed uh, a similar in in people. This is work done by well, it was done by several investigators in the 1960s. And uh, this particular experiment was done by a guy named Mike Freeman. And uh, what uh, Dr. Friedman did is he took healthy people, relatively healthy people. They were men. How healthy could they be in their 40s? And uh, they set up a, a way that they could examine the blood vessels. And to do this, you look at the whites of the eyes, the, the sclera of the eye. And you see those pictures off to your right of the, of the whites of the eye. And that was set up with a, a microscope and they took some still pictures. And you see the, uh, the frame on your left, you see lots of blood vessels. Oh boy, oh boy. There you go. You see lots of blood vessels here thick blood vessels and, and a, a real rich circulation. And then what uh, they do is they feed this man a diet, one meal that contains 67% of the calories as fat. And his particular meal happened to be two eggs, four strips of bacon, milk, cream, bread, and two pats of butter, one meal. 
And what happened is you see four hours later, the picture of the same area of the eye. Blood vessels has disappeared. The reason they've disappeared is because the capillaries are transparent. And the only reason you see the vessels is because of the red blood cells flowing through the vessels. And when you cause them to clump and stick, no blood flows through the vessels. And so they disappear. This happens throughout the entire body, not just in your eyes, it happens to your brain and your toes, every place. Anyway, just to summarize what happens here, and we have animal experiments that show that milk protein can cause this kind of reaction where the lymphocytes produce antibodies to milk protein, which attack the myelin sheaths, which are the coatings of your nerves and destroy the myelin sheaths. And as a consequence of destroying the sheaths, the nerves are destroyed and a person develops multiple sclerosis. So how about, uh, how about treating multiple sclerosis? I mean, I've told you some really negative things about this disease and I'm gonna tell you some negative things about some other problems. What about treating multiple sclerosis? Well, Dr. Swank dedicated his career to treating multiple sclerosis. And uh, what he did was he used a low fat diet. Total fat intake was 40 to 50 grams compared to the American diet of 100 to 175 grams, particularly saturated fat. He got rid of all the animal fats in the diet of MS patients and no limit on starches, vegetables, and fruits. And what Dr. Swank found is he found, and we'll see his words, Dr. Swank found that a difference of eight grams of saturated fat intake daily resulted in a threefold increased chance of dying of multiple sclerosis. Kind of remember those numbers, eight grams of fat in experiments that lasted decades. Eight grams of fat increased the risk of dying by threefold. Here's eight grams of fat for you. An ounce of pork sausage, that's eight grams. You know, a, a hamburger, eight grams. I'm not saying and, I'm saying or. A porterhouse steak, eight grams. You know, cheese, very small plate, eight grams. In other words, pretty much everybody who has multiple sclerosis is now eating the West, rich Western diet. Anyway, Dr. Swank, he uh, applied therapy for people with multiple sclerosis by feeding them a low fat diet. And as I has mentioned to you, you know, I have a legal agreement to carry on his work. So you know how much I believe in his work and plus, as I mentioned, we ran two programs, two Dr. Swank programs at my uh, clinic in, in the Napa Valley at St. Lita Hospital. So we had a very close association. Uh, this is what he says about, about what will happen if you put somebody with multiple sclerosis on a healthy diet. He said that it uh, decreased by about 70% the first year, the number of attacks were reduced by about 70%. And then after the first year, there was continued improvement with 5% fewer attacks for the next two years. And then for 16 years of treatment of the low fat diet, the rate of new attacks was decreased by 95%. It finishes the on diet beginning actually in December of 1948. And uh, as I saw patients, they were added through the years. Uh, one of the first things we noticed was a marked decrease in the evasion per year per patient. <clears throat> During the first year, there was about a 70% reduction in exacerbation, and in the next two years, about 5% each. And we published our first paper along about this time, at which point there was an enormous decrease in exacerbation rate. We've continued to follow the diet for 16, I mean, follow the exacerbation rate for 16 years came down to a level which was about a reduction of at least 95% and stayed down there during the 16 years and has continued to be that way. So you have a rapid drop in exacerbation rate and uh, followed then by a very low level of, of exacerbation going on for years. Now, I, I had the chance to give the keynote uh, speech where the Multiple Sclerosis Society honored Dr. Swank. And I had a chance to meet about 100 of his uh, participants who've been with him 30 or 40 years. I met people who were in their 70s flying airplanes. I met fully functional people who'd stopped this disease 
You know, I asked Dr. Swank, how often do you find that changing to a low fat diet fails? He told me, well, maybe one in 200, maybe one in 500. Yeah, otherwise you could expect success. Dr. Swank told me about one of his visits to China. He was asked by the Chinese government to come over and look at their cases of multiple sclerosis. This was back in the, you know, before the 1980s, before the diet changed in China. And he said the Chinese government presented five patients to him. And he said, I don't think any of them had multiple sclerosis. But of course, now the Chinese have lots of multiple sclerosis because they switched to the Western diet. Uh, anyway, the question was, is can we make a difference? Uh, I tried to prove this, that we can make a difference. I did a study with Oregon Health and Science University on multiple sclerosis and using the McDougall diet. We got some very positive results uh, because randomization was so biased against us showing any benefits in terms of MS, we didn't show those benefits. But we did show some pretty remarkable things with MS patients. First of all, we showed that people would stick with the diet. 85% of the people stayed with the McDougall diet for a year. And the only interaction we had with them was teaching them a diet. We didn't have any other interaction, but once they learned it, they stuck with it. Why? Because they got such dramatic results and the food tasted good. That's why they stuck with it. And so you see the red is the control group up there and they stuck with their, their control diet, the Western diet, which was 40% fat. And you see that we put people in the program, they dropped their fat intake to around 10 to 15%, and they maintained it for a year. That's pretty remarkable, don't you think? And at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, one year trial period, we allowed to, the control group to join the program. That's why you see the mark drop in the red line that occurs at the end. Anyway, we, uh, oh, we, we showed some pretty remarkable things in this study, even though we didn't show everything that I'd hoped to. The uh, average weight loss was nearly 20 pounds a year. Average cholesterol drop was nearly 20 points. We reduced the blood insulin levels. We improved fatigue. And as I mentioned, we had tremendous adherence. One of the studies we published out of this particular main study was the fact that about 80% of people with MS have such severe fatigue that they can't function at work and in family. They just are so tired. Well, we showed a dramatic improvement in fatigue levels that occurred almost overnight when people changed to a healthy diet. I had some personal conversation with Dr. Swank that I'd like to share with you now. One thing I asked him is why don't people comply uh, you know, with these recommendations? He said to me, he said, you know, most people in this country expect to be cured by a pill to have a cure that is almost instantaneous. With a low fat diet, the people actually have to work to get better and they have to cure themselves. He went on, he said, one problem is culture. We are a meat potato society. Most importantly, there's an economic problem. There's really not much money in diet. Does that sound familiar? Nutrition has not been taught in medical schools for many years, and it still isn't taught. Why no support from neurologists or the MS Society? Well, this is really telling. He says to me, as far as the MS Society is concerned, John, he says they don't mention it because they didn't discover it. It wasn't their research dollars that found this treatment, so they're not going to tell anybody. I discovered it in my small office here in the basement of the medical school. It's called NIH, not invented here. If it's not invented here, not a reason to tell you about it. it doesn't support our, our business. All right, the Arthritis Foundation, what do they say about treating another autoimmune disease? We're gonna leave MS now. We're gonna treat, uh, talk about arthritis. What do they say about, uh, about arthritis? And, uh, well, first of all, I, I have to tell you what we're talking about here is the pain in any joint. You know, you can get arthritis from, from injuring a, a joint. That's called arthritis. You can get arthritis from gout. You can get an infection in your joint. That would be arthritis too. But the kind of arthritis we're talking about is where the body attacks itself, an autoimmune disease. 
I got a brochure from the uh, Arthritis Foundation. It was unsolicited back in 1978. This was sent to me, the truth about diet and arthritis from the Arthritis Foundation. It's simply this, there's no special diet for arthritis. There's no specific food that has anything to do with causing it. And there's no specific diet will cure it. Well, even at that time, everybody knew that gout was incurable. It was essentially 100% of the time with diet, but they weren't talking about gout. They were talking about autoimmune inflammatory arthritis. Now, they went on to say food fanatics and peddlers of health and nature foods may tell you otherwise. They said this in the brochure. I could have been offended. Other doctors will take the attitude, well, you know, there's no reason to teach people anything about diet in terms of arthritis because it's been proven to not be of any value. And here is proof that it's been proven. I have this brochure from the Arthritis Foundation. Same thing with patients, just saying, let's hand them this brochure and they go, oh, the authorities have spoken. I might as well give up. In 2014, the Arthritis Foundation, they changed their pitch a little bit. Well, there is no specific diet uh, that people with rheumatoid arthritis should follow. Researchers have identified certain foods that can help control inflammation. Many of them are found in the so-called Mediterranean diet. They're heading in the right direction, aren't they? Currently, 2020, the Arthritis Foundation says, the bottom line is you don't have to adopt an all or nothing attitude to receive the benefits of a mostly plant-based diet. Going vegan or vegetarian doesn't have to be a full-time commitment. I mean, come on. They're telling you to do it and then they're telling you you can't. You don't have to. Well, you have to. It's gotta be 100% because these autoimmune diseases they don't require much of the offending food to get you in trouble. This is an auto, this is an allergic type reaction, an autoimmune reaction. I mean, it's like if you went to the dentist and you were allergic to penicillin, the dentist said, I'll just give you a little shot of penicillin. You're going to be a lot dead from the reaction. It doesn't take much. You can't do a little bit and get well with their message that they currently have out there, even though they're sending you in the right direction because the science is so overwhelming that rheumatoid arthritis is caused and cured by a change in diet that they can't deny it anymore, but they still tell you, you can't do it, don't bother. Maybe what they think is they're relieving guilt on your part, but what they're doing is they're condemning you. They're condemning you to a lifetime of disability and drugs all right, you should take this serious. This is really serious because one of the earlier studies, and uh, there's no reason to believe it's changed at all these days, was published in 1987, where they looked at a large group of rheumatoid patients that were on the current therapies, the best therapies available. And ladies and gentlemen, we have all kinds of biologic and TNF inhibitors and all kinds of high class, very expensive monoclonal antibody type drugs. And there's no evidence that says that anything is different than what they found in 1987 and reported in the Lancet. And that is the use of gold chloroquine steroids and in resistant cases, penicillin and cytotoxic drugs. By 20 years, 35% were dead. And another 25% were disabled. They were bedridden or wheelchair bound. In other words, if you listen to the Arthritis Foundation and your rheumatologist in most cases, there are some exceptions out there, you are condemned. Not only to the ravages of this disease, but to the toxicity and costs of the drugs, which are obscene. 20, 30, $40,000 a year just for the medication. Drugs that cause cancer, drugs that cause infections for a tiny little benefit at best. All right, so let's talk about the dietary issues when it comes to inflammatory arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. These are the inflammatory arthritis as opposed to osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear arthritis and gout, which is due to you know eating a lot of uric acid, high rich foods. Let's talk about inflammatory arthritis for a minute. Uh, some researchers believe that rheumatoid arthritis did not exist anywhere in the world before 1800. 
these kinds of arthritis were rare to non-existent in Asian and African countries. And uh, as recently as 1957, no cases of rheumatoid arthritis could be found in Africa. And as of 1960, they found the first case of lupus in Africa. As I mentioned to you a couple of minutes ago, the African-Americans, the blacks in this country have the highest incidence of lupus of any subpopulation. What happened? They changed their diet. And so here you see the low prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis in the Chinese, basically non-existent. And the same thing in Africa, rheumatoid arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis, essentially non-existent. And then they started treating people. Uh, this is an effort that started out with single patients that were reported in the scientific literature that would just occasionally came up in articles like the British Medical Journal. They talk about a case report of somebody that cured themselves by changing their diet. I, you know, this goes back a ways. This goes back 40, 50 years. But I want to tell you where we started an occasional case came out. And here's a case published in, uh, in uh, the Annals of Arthritis and Rheumatism. Very, very important journal for arthritis doctors. And uh, what they find is that uh, they had 26 patients in the study and they improved with a change in diet. This is the classic study that was published in the British Medical, or excuse me, in the Lancet, a controlled trial of fasting, a one-year vegetarian diet with rheumatoid arthritis. Fasting, there was actually a juice fast, but again, they eliminated all dairy, all meat, et cetera. At the end of a week, all the patients showed improvement. At the end of a year and two years, those who stuck with the diet showed improvement. Dramatic improvement. Some of them you could only call cure. And we studied, published a study back uh, a few years ago, 2002. So what would that be almost 40 years ago? We published a study on the dietary treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. And we showed benefits even back then. Since then, there have been a few attempts to, to give people the advantage of a healthy diet. Study published in rheumatology in 2001, a, a vegan diet without wheat, barley, and rye, improved arthritis patients. And then we just have a study. Well, let's see what this one said. The one year effects of a vegan diet, 22% of the vegan patients and 25 on a non-vegan diet for nine months. But of the patients who followed the vegan diet, they got better. You know, nine of the patients uh, got better. whereas very few of them got better on the non-vegan diet. In a study just published, the improvement of inflammatory pain after three months of exclusion diet of rheumatoid arthritis, they excluded meat and gluten and lactose and just for three months and they showed dramatic improvement. What, what should you expect? What you should expect and what my experience has been is that within four to seven days, you should see four to seven days, you should experience improvement. It takes four to seven days to get the bad food out of the gut. You shouldn't expect improvement for, for fewer than four to seven days. And then things start to get better. And if you're not all better in four months, then you're likely not gonna get any better. But almost everybody gets dramatically better with the dietary change that I recommend within four months, which you can't be as unrealistic. You can't expect your crooked joints to straighten out. All you can expect is no further attacks. Uh, lupus, there's a uh, study published on lupus, which is a similar disease. It's one of the inflammatory arthritis. And uh, they gave up dairy. Those who gave up dairy did the best as far as improvement goes. Uh, and it's not just the, the, you know, the crippling hot red joint type of uh, attack that occurs. There's a milder form of uh, autoimmune disease, uh, which attacks the muscles and the joints and the tendons. And it's not bad enough to call it an arthritis, not bad enough to label it rheumatoid or lupus, but we label it fibromyalgia, which used to be a problem that almost everybody seemed to suffer back 10 years ago and fibromyalgia again, treated with a healthy diet, you get tremendous improvement. I'm trying to show you there's a reason for you to look other in other directions for help. 
And I can share with you my experience, was, which, which, is, which says that you should expect to get dramatically better. All right, all kinds of problems. As I mentioned to you, this attack on your body occurs from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And these were the diseases that I told you, every part of the body, including nonspecific inflammation like fibromyalgia, it's every place. Let's take a look at some of the other autoimmune diseases that have been treated with a healthy diet. Here's one where they treated ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And 15 out of 16 patients uh, were essentially cured. They got a remission. And when they talk about their semi-vegetarian diet, I give you a picture of it down there in the left-hand corner. What you see is this is a vegan diet. They call it a semi-vegetarian diet, but it's a vegan diet. And here you have schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is, I know you wouldn't think about it. It's a uh, they consider it a psychiatric disease, but there's been considerable evidence that says this is another autoimmune disease where the body attacks itself. A couple of papers that I'd like you to read for those of you interested in schizophrenia and its uh, variant, which is called autism, and they're bottom, down in the bottom left-hand corner. You get these two papers and you'll see the connection between diet and these two conditions. But there are also other modern research articles published right now, you know, last year, this year, a couple of years ago, saying that uh, schizophrenia, this psychiatric illness is caused by an autoimmune reaction that has its basis in the gut. You know, one explanation that I had that maybe made a little bit of sense to me as to what happens in a patient who has schizophrenia is, they have a, a lot of delusions, a lot of visuals, a lot of hearing distortions. And the comparison that I was given was, this is like somebody on hallucinogenic drugs, like LSD. And uh, what is explained is that uh, these antigen antibody complexes that are formed have actual neuropsychiatric capabilities, which causes you to have these kind of reactions that are similar to hallucinogenics. The antigen antibody complex is somehow lodged in the brain or produces some subchemicals that give you this kind of reaction. Uh, cow's milk published in 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is a beautiful, beautiful paper. Got no attention. But what they did is they looked at, uh, at adults and children who had nephrotic syndrome, which is where the kidneys are inflamed, and you're about to end up on a dialysis machine. They took uh, four of the participants, which happened to be children, and they biopsied their kidneys. And you see here in the frame that is labeled A, B, and C, you can see the, the attack of the kidney tissues by antibodies that were created by an initial reaction with cow's milk. In other words, what happens is the cow's milk got through the gut wall into the bloodstream where it shouldn't have been and the body made antibodies that now cross react through molecular mimicry with the kidney tissues. And so not only did the antibodies attack the milk protein but you can see them laid all over the kidney tissues in this, uh, these immunofluorescence pictures. So interesting, they followed up on these kids, uh, four of the kids, who they found the circulating antibodies in their bloodstream and the changes in their kidneys that you see here. And they took them off the milk. And all four of them went through remission. Why isn't it that everybody isn't told this? Why isn't it that every pediatrician and every pediatrician deals with children who have kidney problems? Why aren't they being told about this crucial research? You know, these, these children were destined to end up on a dialysis machine to have a kidney transplant and or to be dead and sick. All right, so how do I approach uh, people who have autoimmune diseases? Well, first of all, I feed them the basic diet 
And most people get well with the basic diet. If you go to our website, drmcdougall.com, this is free. You know, there's a whole 12 day program. You can do it. Many people do it. Thousands of people have done it. Of course, we would encourage you to look into our 12 day internet program, which is you know, the easiest way, the best way to ensure success. And we run this uh, 12 day program every month. Uh, and it's done over the internet. We have tremendous support in your home, et cetera. But hey folks, it's free. It's on the website. We have over 4,000 recipes published in the McDougall cookbook app, which has a thousand recipes and 13 national best-selling books on the website and they're free, 4,000 recipes. The next step that I take is I put people on a gluten-free diet and you say, well, how can you do that on the McDougall diet? Well, I just avoid the high gluten starches, that's all which would be wheat, barley, and rye, and some of their subvariants. That's what you have to avoid. These are the high gluten foods, but there are all kinds of starches that you could be choosing that have low levels of this glycoprotein, this gluten, such as corn and millet and quinoa and rice and wild rice and any of your root vegetables, your legumes, all your green and yellow vegetables. It's no problem at all following a gluten-free diet when you're on the McDougal diet. You ought to do it. You should do it if you're not getting well and you have any of these inflammatory problems, any of these autoimmune diseases. You need to make this change as a second step. I know a lot of you out there have made the change as a first step when you weren't even sick from any gluten problems. You know, you go to the grocery store and about 40% of the products in a grocery store are sold to you as being gluten-free. So what? So what? I mean, only 1% of the population at most, at most has celiac disease or dermatitis hepatiformis, which is the skin condition related to wheat, barley, and rye. You know, one out of 100 people, maybe one out of 250, yet they're, they're, uh, they're marketing to 40% of the people at least who are looking to gluten-free products. You're not gonna get better. Your attention is spent in the wrong direction. This is a, a disastrous distraction for you to be interested in a gluten-free diet if you don't have de definite problems related to gluten. And plus the poor folks that really do have celiac disease and get really sick if they end up having wheat, barley, and rye, they're, they're, they're served poorly too by this general message that everybody's sick due to gluten. You know, here you have a situation where the person with real celiac disease goes to a restaurant, orders a meal without any croutons or breads or whatever, and the waiter comes out and brings a soup that has croutons all over it. And the customer says, well, didn't I tell you I have celiac disease? You know, I'll end up vomiting, I'll get sick, I'll have, have diarrhea. I'll, you know, you'll have to call the ambulance if I eat that meal. And the waiter says, you know, the last 40 people who were in here that told me they were gluten sensitive. I gave them the, the soup with the croutons. They didn't complain. We need to get this straightened out. Okay, the next step is to try the elimination diet, which is described in detail in my May 2014 newsletter, which by the way, also describes my May 2014 newsletter it describes 10 cases of severe, debilitating, potentially deadly inflammatory arthritis. It's a great newsletter, but it also goes into the, the elimination diet, which is the foods that people are least likely to react to. All right, so your first step in dealing with these autoimmune diseases is you stop putting animal proteins in the gut. Because as I mentioned to you, we're animals, and so the cross-reaction is very easy between animal foods and us as animals. Whereas plant, their proteins, their parts are so different. They're in a whole different kingdom. They're in the plant kingdom, we're in the animal kingdom. So that even if plant proteins get into the bloodstream and the body makes antibodies to them, they're not gonna find any similar proteins on your body. All right, well, you know, considering all possibilities, uh, occasionally somebody has to be on it a much more restrictive diet, which will attend to the bowel integrity, cure the leaky gut, give you the minimal amount of offending proteins, 
and a diet that is most likely to cause you to get well. It's called the elimination diet. And I've used this for 40 years. And there are people occasionally who have to do this. Elimination diet, you have uh, brown rice, puffed rice, sweet potatoes, tapioca, taro. That's your starch. Or those are the starches you're least likely to, least likely to react to. And then you have non-starchy green and yellow vegetables, all thoroughly cooked, all cooked. Why do you cook them? You cook everything because it denatures the protein and makes them less likely to, for you to react to them. And you can have fruits, a couple of fruits that I just added here, which you know I'm the author of the elimination diet and I, so I can do this. I added it to the fruit category and I almost added it to the starch category is jackfruit and breadfruit, which is about 93, 94% carbohydrate, only about 3% protein. And oh, you can make some tasty dishes out of jackfruit. And that's why I was tempted to make it a starch, but it's really a fruit. One last thing as far as you're changing your diet and trying to get well, I know that you heard the word vegan and you heard the word vegetarian. It's not enough. You know, vegetarians, they often eat uh, dairy and egg products, and they could even be, uh, be fish eaters, pesco vegetarians, pollo vegetarians, they eat chicken. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, you can't do that. You're not going to get well. And when I mentioned vegan or vegetarian diet, many of you don't understand the important impact of oil. Oil will keep you sick. It, it somehow injures the gut or injures the immune system to the point where you just don't get well. And for example, in this particular study where they put people for a week on a water fast and they got well, and then they put them on a diet, a vegan diet that was 42% fat. And almost all of them got sick again, except for those with psoriasis. They seem, I don't know why they seem to stay well. You can't add the vegetable oils to the diet. You can't get to this stage of solving your problems and then ruin it by putting corn oil or safflower oil or canola oil or flaxseed oil or any kind of oils over the top of it because you'll ruin it and you'll ruin the benefits. The last step would be for you to go to the ultimate elimination diet. And I do this with occasional persons. You know, maybe one out of every 300 people. I'll get to an insolvable situation. Either I can't get them to change their diet or somehow or another, I miss something. Well, I send them to the ultimate elimination experience. And it was convenient when we had our clinic in Santa Rosa because True North, which is a fasting center with great fame and deservedly so, was only about two city blocks from us in Santa Rosa, California. They have great doctors there, they have great care there. And if you can't get well with the recommendations that I gave to you, which is gonna be very rare, but this is the next step I'd offer you. But I have to point out to you that what they're gonna do for you is only temporary. You can't water fast forever. You have to learn to eat. And of course they teach you the McDougal diet when you leave. But for most people, you can skip the step of water fasting to search out your, your ways of being cured. For most of you, almost all of you. But those of you who need a little extra help, True North is there. All right, so you got a choice. Uh, you could look at your future and you could decide that you're not going to suffer the drugs, the disabilities, the early death, the pain. And what you're going to do is you're going to fix the problem by dealing with the cause. It causes the food. You fix the food, you'll stop attacking every single tissue in your body, all the way from the top of your scalp to the soles of your feet. Thank you. I'm Dr. John McDougall. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You can find me, of course, at drmcdougall.com. All right. So, AJ, did I keep you awake? Yes, you did. And we have so many questions. You, you're such a good lecturer. How do you put this together so quickly? Well, you know, I, I really have to say that uh, I, I wasn't given a lot of gifts in life, but I was given the ability to speak and write. And I really enjoy it. I, mean, I spent, you know, AG, I'll tell you what happened. I thought I was giving this lecture on the 7th of next month. 
you know, the first Monday, for first Monday of the month. And I uh, forgot that we agreed for, to me to come on every two weeks. So here I am Saturday night and I get your notice that I'm giving this lecture on Monday morning. Whoa. Not to say the least, I wasn't prepared. I spent, I spent 14 hours yesterday putting this lecture together. And you know, it's as good as if I'd have taken 14 days. It's just a matter of being stimulated to put it together. I, I really enjoyed putting this together. I had a great day yesterday. I had a good time uh, sharing this with you. I, I hope it was simple enough. You know, I hope I put it in the context of the other health problems, medical problems that you have, that there's a basic understanding that you need to accomplish. Otherwise you'll be mistreated. You don't need to understand that early detection is late detection. It's a 10 year old disease when it comes to cancer. You must understand that uh, the lesions that doctors are operating on with their angioplasties and their bypass surgery are old scars. They never kill. What kills are the little pimples that pop. Once you understand that everything makes sense. When you understand that uh, the common kind of diabetes is due to the body making normal adaptations to stay alive and to survive. It's creating insulin resistance because it's supposed to, it's normal, it's not a disease. Then you won't be fighting your type two diabetes other than by curing it because it's 100% curable with a change in diet. And now that you understand that the, the body does attack itself because it gets confused. It gets confused because animal proteins are floating around in the bloodstream, they're not supposed to be. And you're an animal. And sometimes uh, the antibodies that are being made by the lymphocytes aren't specific enough. So they attack the food, the milk, the meat, the pork, etc., And they attack you too. As I started out this lecture, I told you that, that you know, about 34 to 40% of women have thyroid problems in their 40s and 50s. At least 10%. And it's very common. And uh, that's because they eat foreign thyroid glands. You know, thyroid glands from pigs and cows. You go to a slaughterhouse, they waste nothing. You know, after they stun the animal, take off the fur and the skin. And they take off, they strip off the muscles. And then what they do is they take the leftover parts, the scrotums, the vaginas, the lips, the tails, the spleens, the livers, the blood vessels, the thyroid glands. And they grind them up and they make them into hot dogs sausages. And you eat these things, you eat these pig and cow thyroids, guess what, your body's going to make antibodies to them. And because they're not so specific, they're going to make antibodies to your own thyroid gland and destroy your thyroid gland. This is also simple, folks. You know, it's the body doing something normal and natural, which is defend itself from foreign things. You're eating foreign things, you're eating things that the body was really never intended to eat certainly at any, any frequency that it eats, which are all these animal foods and all these junk foods. You know, otherwise you wouldn't have the rheumatoid arthritis. Otherwise you would not have the multiple sclerosis. These diseases do not exist in parts of the world where people eat starch-based diets. I showed you, they don't exist. But as these populations change to the Western diet, guess what happens? You know, they start eating the foods that make you sick and there's nothing, nothing special about you if you happen to have a certain pigmentation to your skin or a certain slant of your eyes. You know, you're, you're, you're just like plain old human beings. And if you move to a new environment, you're gonna be struck down by the foods of that environment. You know, your genes are not gonna protect you. Even though there's so much effort placed on heredity, that's a blind alley. Even if it was due to heredity, you can't fix it. Don't waste your time. You can't change your genes. Fix what you can fix. You can fix the food. Well, Dr. McDougall, there are a lot of people that have already been following a plant-based diet that are still getting some of these autoimmune diseases and they seem to be on the rise. Or in the patients and in individual people. 
Well, who are we talking about, uh, AJ? We're talking about somebody that has contacted you that says that they changed their diet and that they didn't get better, or are we talking about the whole population of the world that's on the rise? Well, but just just people I know, like like personally, I I was diagnosed with uh, hypothyroidism in my fifties, and I had already been vegan for over thirty years. But but AJ, the thyroid gland is gone. It's not going to grow back. But you weren't a vegan when you were a young woman. True. And you destroyed your gland then. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, you see, <laughs> but it's just like your joints, your joints may be all crooked like this. You're not going to straighten those joints out by eating potatoes. It's gone. The tissue's gone. Same thing with the type one diabetes. You know, you can't eat spaghetti noodles and expect your pancreas to grow back. It's not going to do it. It's gone. So the fact that you have the ravages of destroyed tissues is what you should expect, but you should expect to get no more of these problems. No, no. Yeah, that's all. You, 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 no, you, I mean, you, I'm, the you yeah. see what I mean? Okay. Absolutely. It just seemed though, like I remember I was born in 1960 and I had heard about diabetes as a child, but nobody was really talking about autoimmune disease in the 60s. It seems to be so much more prevalent in the last 10 and 20 uh. years. It's becoming more prevalent. Why? Because more people around the world are eating the Western diet. You know, as I told you, the blacks in this country have, they have the highest incidence of lupus of any subgroup of people and any skin color of people. Blacks have the highest rates of lupus, yet lupus was not described in Africa, which is the native country. Before 1960, there were no cases of lupus reported. Did they not, not pay attention? Well, there were lots of good doctors in Africa too. In fact, some really, really great researchers went to Africa to study the people and they wouldn't have missed it. So yeah, it's becoming more prevalent, just like, uh, you know, just like obesity. What have we gone from a situation where when I was a kid, 17% of the population was obese. Now it's 30, 40% are obese, not just overweight, but obese. And it's predicted that soon 70% will be obese. Yeah, people are eating more rich foods. Industry is supplying more rich foods for us at a cheaper price. More calories, more fat, more protein, you know, for a buck. So, yeah. When a person has autoimmune disease, does it predispose them for any other diseases? Yes. Yes, particularly if you have celiac disease. Uh, people who have rheumatoid arthritis are more likely to have type one diabetes. So, but again, the, the, the common denominator might go all the way back to the leaky gut caused by, by wheat, barley, and rye, or in, you know, the wrong bacteria growing in the intestinal tract and damaging the surface of the intestinal tract and causing it to be leaky. So it may have leaked in, you know, thyroid proteins. It may have leaked in, uh, proteins that are similar to those in your joints. Uh, the amino acid sequences that I've showed you, which are, you know, there may be 17 amino acids, uh, et cetera. Uh, there have been research studies showing that they can find on the collagen of the joints, they can find a sequence of amino acids that matches also the dairy. So there are lots and lots of kinds, you know, thousands of different proteins that come into the body when you eat an animal. You know, you have muscle protein, you have collagen protein, you have lymphocyte protein, you have red blood cell protein. I mean, all kinds of proteins you eat. And if those are gonna leak through the gut wall and your body can only handle a certain number of them and finds a few that it cross reacts with, yeah, you might destroy your thyroid and become a type one diabetic and have rheumatoid arthritis at a higher frequency than the general population. Yes. Great. Are you ready for some questions that were sent in? I am. Okay. The first one is from Carol. And have you ever heard of LECT2 and will diet help at all? What is it called? LEPT2? L-E-C-T, LECT2. It's some kind of rare kidney disease, I believe. I've never heard of it. No. And I, boy, I, pretty, I, I thought I pretty much knew the kidney diseases. Okay. Well, no problem. That's okay. Yeah. Apparently it's very rare. So, all right, here's a great general question and guys, you got to send them in when we have Dr. McDougall on, cause there's so many, but Lisa has a great question. What blood work is required to diagnose an autoimmune disease? Okay. Well, there, there are a couple of, uh, there are a couple of uh, glycoproteins 
that you can find in the blood of people who have a greater chance of having celiac disease. And I, I, I forget the names, but you can look at my, anyway, so someplace on my website, the, the, the two, en two enzymes that I found in the blood that are of higher value. And so that's one of the diagnostic tests used for celiac. But it's, it's such a slow, uh, such a, uh, a poor association that you can't make the diagnosis based on these blood tests. To make the diagnosis of celiac disease, what you have to do is a bowel biopsy. You have to go in and take a piece of the bowel and look at it under the microscope and you see the, the changes in the brush border like I showed you. In other words, you go from standing up villi to flattened villi. And that's how you make the diagnosis. But otherwise, there are no, no specific, well, that's not true. They're like, for example, lupus, you have anti-nuclear antibody. So there, there, are, there are antibody tests that you can do that help you diagnose certain autoimmune diseases. But you've got to get to the point where you have so many anti this and anti that and so on, that you have to realize that this is a big deal. You know, you've got, you've got uh, all kinds of foreign stuff that got into your system that the body's making antibodies towards. They're making bad antibodies towards the nuclei of the cell, anti-nuclear antibodies. They're making, uh, they're making antibodies against the thyroid tissue. Okay, it's called autoimmune thyroiditis. Anyway, uh, you dump a whole bunch of protein in there, you're gonna get a whole bunch of backlash and the body's, I think the way, again, the way you ought to be looking at this is you say, how in the world could my body put up with this kind of abuse? Not how in the world does it survive? I mean, you should ask how it survives. You should, you should ask, why am I not sicker? You should praise your body for doing as well as it can under such dire circumstances. You live in a tough machine. It wants to be healthy. Well, she said that her cheeks are red or pink, and but but her doctor says she doesn't have lupus. Okay. Well, see, they were looking for anti-nuclear antibodies, ANAs. That's why you classically diagnose lupus. But, you know, it doesn't matter, AJ. I don't even bother finding out whether somebody has lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or, or nonspecific arthritis. It doesn't make any difference. These are just, just categories you put people into based upon certain findings but they're all caused by the same problem, the food. They're all unresponsive to present day therapies, you know, the drugs, the drugs. And the outcome is the same. I mean, people end up with terrible disability and death. You don't have to give it a special name to know what to do. You've got inflammatory arthritis. That's caused by the food. You don't care what else you call it. Call it lupus, call it psoriatic, call it rheumatoid. Doesn't help. No, you, you, you know what to do and fix the food. You won't Thank be disappointed. You. It this takes four to seven days to start getting better. How long can you, is your patience last? You, you will start seeing improvement almost within a week. Yeah. Dr. McDougall, this question from Sally is interesting because it, it po poses the question, like if you've suffered a long time, is there still hope? She says she has a 70 year old sister that was diagnosed with MS when she was in her twenties. She's bedridden, but has use of her upper body, has been on infusions many years to manage the disease. Is there any hope for a reversal or partial reversal of MS at this point of her life, given all the medication she has taken? Yeah, Dr. Swank actually looked at, at that and I used to have the paper, but I'm sure it can be found. And maybe I got it still, I don't know. I copied a lot of Swank's work to my computer before it got burned up. But he, uh, he took, there, there are six stages of MS, you know, six, six stages of disability all the way from fully walking to being bedridden. And what he finds is that in each stage, you can slow the progression of the multiple sclerosis. But as you get to more severe diseases, you know, there's very little, there's much less margin for improvement. But his work clearly shows that even if you're at the worst stages, you can make a difference in terms of the progress of the illness, not as much as I'm sure you'd like, which is to be, to recover, to be functional again. You're not gonna get that. 
But yeah, you can slow the progress and Swank is documented in his papers. Great, thank you. Uh, guys, when they're really long, I'm gonna have to kind of shorten them, but Heather says, I'm 33 years old and have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, anti-phospholipid antibody syndrome, eosinophilic esophagitis, asthma, food environmental allergies, bursitis, rheumatoid arthritis, hypermobility, high cholesterol, migraines, low functioning gallbladder and fatigue. And uh, she hasn't seen a rheumatologist since before the pandemic, but she wants to know if you believe all the problems could stem from one main cause, maybe leaky gut. Is there a specific test for leaky yeah. gut? And what tests would you recommend? And what specialists would you recommend she work with? I think she'd be perfect for taking the McDougall program. Uh, she, she'd get the kind of help she needs from us. Uh, Dr. Lim is very well oriented, taking care of people with autoimmune diseases. In fact, I, I have to say, he, just like me, he finds people with autoimmune diseases the most interesting patients because they're so hopeless, they're so sick, and they get so well so fast. But the, the, the list of problems you rattled off uh, just goes to show you that the underlying problem, the denominator to these causes is the food. You know, it's not, it's, yeah, it's, it, you, you don't need to look at it as any individual food, like carrots are causing me lupus. Uh, it's the whole diet. You need to be eating a starch-based diet with, with fruits and vegetables. And as a next step, you need to eliminate the wheat, barley, and rye. As a next step, you need to try the most severe approach short of water fasting that I know of, which is the elimination diet. But you're going to figure it out. It's rare that somebody doesn't figure it out. And it's all in your hands. It costs nothing. There are no side effects. There's no reason not to do it. You know, there's every reason for you to do it. And uh, it'd be nice if you got your doctor's cooperation. And that, which is another question people come up with who have autoimmune diseases. How do I get off these drugs? You're on methotrexate. You're on biologic. You're on INF inhibitors. I mean, you're on a list of drugs that, uh, you know, it's scary. And what do you do? Well, what you do is this, is you go to the specialist, it's gonna be a rheumatologist likely, maybe a general practitioner. I'd like you to work with a general practitioner. I think you're more likely to get better care. And you say, all right, look, I, I'm, I'm changing my diet. I know you don't think it's gonna work, but I do. So it doesn't make any difference. I'm gonna do it anyways. And if I get better, will you reduce the medications? And I can't imagine a doctor not agreeing unless he's got a, he or she's got an ego problem or some other reason for motivating them in a non-patient or, or, or direction. Of course you want you off drugs. These drugs are toxic, they're expensive. So you say to the doc, okay, let's start with the methotrexate or no, let's, not, let's start with the biologics. Let's start with, because they're really expensive. They're 30, 40,000 bucks a year. And toxicity would be cancers and infections and all kinds of horrible things. So let's start with those. And say you're getting a shot once every week. Well, maybe you can make it once every two weeks or every month. That could be part of the bargain. And then you continue to reduce the medication slowly until you get off of them. I don't recommend you stop these, uh, these drugs initially, immediately. We don't do that with people who come to our program. We keep them on the methotrexate, keep them on the biologics. We keep them on the other agents, uh, even after they leave the program and then they work with their doctor at getting off. You could do this. It's not that, it's not that difficult. All you have to do is start, start asking what you deserve, which is proper care. Thank you. Annie wants to know if people doing an elimination diet can do the Kempner diet, fruit smoothies yeah. with sugar and rice. Yeah, they could. Sure. I mean, the Kempner diet is another extreme. I, I, I have a few extreme diets, don't I? <laughs> I have the, I have the maximum weight loss program. I have the, the, the Kempner program, and now I have the elimination diet. Who? And I thought I was, I thought I was really boring. You I forgot got, Mary's I, mini. Yeah, Mary's Mini. Yeah, okay. See, so I, I am not just a, a, a guy that's stuck in the mud that, that can't change his ideas and can't develop new things. I got four different uh, severe programs for you to follow. And then you can water fast. <laughs> then, then I get ready. I go, I send you over to Dr. Alan Goldhammer and let him worry about you. 
actually it's a re really good program. So don't, don't take any of my jokes the wrong way. You, you're going to get really good care from the true North people. But again, that's, a, you know, who wants to go without food for a couple of weeks, but not likely. Wouldn't you just get to get well? I think you really get well because you're going to have to go back to eating when you're done with the water fast. So you might as well just do it. That's what I think. Great. I want to thank Pat for the super chat donation. And I've got more questions coming up. This one is from Phyllis. I have a 44 year old son recently diagnosed with ANCA, anti neutrophilic cytoplasmic autoantibody vasculitis. His right. nephrologist has put him on steroids and an infusion of. Ritu, I can't pronounce it. Yeah, it's one of the referred biologics, him. yeah. Yeah, um, but as well, but she referred him to a nutritionist, but we know most only recommend cutting down on animal flesh and fish protein instead of eliminating. What can I say or do to help him avoid needing a kidney transplant? Well, what, he, what he needs to do is he needs, you need to take control of the situation. Your doctor doesn't care what you eat. Your doctor has no idea what the impact of food will be on your health, I, I bet because we get virtually no education about diet, none about diet therapy. So don't expect the doctor to do anything except they offer a flippant, you know, no basis type of response to you when you say, I eat a vegan diet. Now, I know you might be a little bit threatening, but just do it. Just go home and do it. And then you get better and who can fight with success? And you go in and you say, look, you know, check my antibody levels and see if they're high. I'm not having any more pain or inflammation. You know, well, how about reducing the drugs, doc? Uh, and that's how you do it. You get off of them. And yes, what you described is what I've been trying to tell you. And that is that this is a disease that affects your whole body. You know, it's not just the, the arteries that are being inflamed. You know, your son likely has other manifestations of this chronic inflammation like joint pains and headaches and body aches and maybe some ball problems, et cetera. This goes every place, not just, it's not just specific to the blood vessels like you thought may have thought in his case. You gotta fix, you gotta fix the, whole, the whole problem. You know, people who have rheumatoid arthritis, they have autoimmune diseases of the eye, uveitis. They have autoimmune diseases of the heart. They develop a pericarditis but they're told they have rheumatoid arthritis. Well, yeah, they do. In other words, the joints are manifesting the most of the disease, but it's going on every place throughout your body. You don't have just rheumatoid arthritis. You have a systemic disease that happens to show up most acutely in your joints, but it's every place. It's in your kidneys, it's in your brain, it's in your lungs. In your lungs, I, I think about a patient I had with good pasture syndrome. This was really fun. Uh, this this fellow had lung disease and kidney disease. What's well, called good pasture syndrome, it's due to milk. It's well established due to milk. And so just took him off the milk and his lung problems and his kidney problems went away. It's, it's every place that's attacking you. I, I want you to I want you to get out of the idea that you, if we can only name the disease. You know, if we can only do this one more test, we'll figure out what this little key is that's gonna allow me to be cured. You're not gonna do that. Stop wasting your time and money. This will go on for decades until you finally say, I stop, because you can see you're not getting any better. Now, these agents that we talked about, the biologics, the methotrexate, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, they help with symptoms. Sure they do, and that may be a reason to take them. You may be debilitated to the point where you want this kind of relief. You need this kind of relief to function. So don't throw the drugs away, but don't let somebody give you the idea that taking these drugs is going to change the ultimate course of the disease. It's not going to make you live longer. I doubt if it'll reduce your risk of, in the end, suffering disabilities. Even though these days the drug companies are using this as bragging results because they were so criticized up until recently for not slowing the disability or the chances of dying, no matter how hard they tried. And so they got these new agents, very expensive, very toxic, which may show a tiny bit of improvement. One thing, I'm reading for the super chat donation. 
And we have a question from Chloe. Her mother has Addison's disease, just been diagnosed having, yeah. after having issues with her thyroid. Endocrinologist told her she needs to eat lots of meat and stop taking any vitamins and supplements and wants to put her back on a strong dose of thyroxin along with other drugs. She's not going to go back to him, but she would rather do lifestyle. Can lifestyle help with Addison's disease? With Addison's disease, what this is, is, is an autoimmune disease that attacked the adrenal glands which are called the super renal glands, which are just above the kidneys, which have to do with a tremendous amount of hormones, so mineral corticoids, uh, glucocorticoids are very important. And what happens is the body attacks the adrenal glands. Why? Well, you know, just like with the thyroid, I bet hot dogs have adrenal glands in them. Mm, that's just kind of a fun story, isn't it? Anyway, uh, it's gone. The, the adrenal glands are gone. They're never going to come back. Get over it. Now you may need some supplementation. You may need some mineral corticoids and glucocorticoids and thyroid supplements. You may need these. That's because your glands are gone. You need to have what they used to produce supplemented and you have to do this. This is good medical care. But as far as, you know, the things have gone poorly so far, you've mentioned a whole bunch of problems so far. You think this is going to stop? You think that you think things are going to change? You, you're going to end up like so many of my patients did when I was a young doctor, taking care of other people's patients, by the way, not mine. Laying in a bed, dying of cerebral vascular attacks from the body. I'll never forget this middle-aged woman who had lupus, who became psychiatrically ill, you know, that was the manifestations of the body attacking the brain. And she became bloated and she became kidney failure and lung failure and then she died. You know, that's what happens. I, got, I told you, 70% of the people within 10 years have severe disabilities or they're dead with the best drugs available for MS. What did I tell you within 20 years with the best drugs available? You know, 20% of people are disabled, 35% are dead. This is something to brag about. Maybe all the way to the bank, <laughs> but certainly not when you look somebody in the eye and say, you know, I'm here to help. So, you know, you're not gonna turn down the standard therapies. You're gonna get over them. You're gonna minimize your need for them and you will need some things, you know, like you always are gonna need the supplementation for the thyroid. You're gonna be taking Synthroid. You're always gonna need adrenal supplements. That's never gonna change. But you don't wanna have any further attacks. You don't wanna have the body attack and destroy your eyes and your brain and your liver and it attacks every place cholangitis, which is where, where the body attacks the, the bile ducts of the liver. There's not a tissue. The only thing I can think of is my hair and my whiskers don't get attacked because they're dead. Otherwise, my glasses. <laughs> it's every place. You can, live in a, you can live in a body of inflammation due to molecular mimicry, due to you choosing animal foods, due to an otherwise sickly diet that allows for a leaky gut, you can keep doing that or you can get well. Cost you nothing. There are no side effects. It will give you a great bowel movement. Cut your food bill by 80%. Tell me why you shouldn't do it. Hey, we run a program every month. Believe me, if you find it too hard by doing the free program, on the McDougal site, then you ought to do like 40, 50 people do every month. They come and allow the McDougal team to help them get over the hurdles. This is not easy. It may appear easy and it is for some people, but for a lot of us, these are big changes to make. You got to get off the drugs. You need medical supervision to get off the medications. We're one of the few places in the world that's focused on getting you off unnecessary medications. You need that help. You need somebody to come and see you every morning to find out what your blood sugar, your blood pressure is and 
how you're doing and what you're going to fix for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that day. Our support specialists are there to help you. Why, why do you think we do this? Yeah, it's a nice business. We love doing this and so does all of our staff because not only do we get to make a, a decent living, but we get to help people. You can imagine how happy our staff is. Our staff's been with us as long as 20 years because it gets so much reward from running a practice where people get better. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll fix you. In 12 days, we'll fix you. You'll be better. You'll get over the hurdles. We, we got a team that will work over you to, to the point where you won't have any excuses. You'll love what you're doing. Oh, yeah, we're here. We've been doing this. We've been doing this for 44 years. You know, uh, 16 at St. Helena Hospital, 18 at, uh, at the resort clinic in Santa Rosa and now uh, a telemarketing, telemedicine program. 44 years I've been at this. I've probably learned a few things. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. This is from Julie. I'm 57, was diagnosed with hypothyroidism and sarcoidosis, both autoimmune issues in 1988 after the birth of my first child. In the last 10 years, I've experienced several seemingly unrelated health issues. After being diagnosed with palindromic rheumatism about five years ago, I went gluten-free. Um, is the whole food plant-based SOS-free lifestyle enough to heal me or do I need to do something more? And will my hypothyroidism and or sarcoidosis improve? No, no I, I don't know how to stress this enough is what is destroyed is permanently destroyed. Your thyroid gland has been permanently destroyed. It's not gonna grow back. You need to take a supplement, a hormone supplement, just like your pancreas is not gonna grow back if you have type one diabetes. You need to take a supplement, it's called insulin. So you, you need to face the fact that what you have done has caused damage that's permanent. You just don't wanna get any further damage. You know, AJ, each and every story you've told me, each and every question has, has been about somebody who has ongoing problems that are getting worse and worse and worse. And they've gone through a multitude of, of different organs being affected by the body attacking itself. You know, they, these questioners are telling the story that I've been trying to tell for the last hour and a half. Is this disease that attacks your entire body and it doesn't stop? And you'll stop the cause. You make the gut heal. You stop eating the animals and the oil. And it stops. How often does it stop? Pretty much every time. I mean, my experience has been really rewarding. I can't say that and I would never, I would never claim hundred percent, but I can tell you, if you don't get better, the first question I have is, are you really doing it? And the next question I have for you is, don't you think we ought to give it more than four days? Because likely you're, you're evaluating the results in a too short a period of time. It took you more than a month to get into trouble. It took you decades to get into trouble. It will take you four months to get out of trouble, but you'll be left with some residual. The thyroid gland will not grow back. The, the pancreas will not grow back. Your destroyed joints will not grow back. Okay, they're always gonna be crooked, but you don't want new ones. You don't want new attacks. You don't want, you want the body to stop attacking itself. Great, thank you. This is from Margo. And she appreciates all that you and Mary do to help you people follow this lifestyle. She says she's a 58 year old woman with Hashimoto's and I don't know if I'll pronounce this right. Shod Shod Shogun's Shogun's is a, it's a disease of the collagen tissue. It's again, it's the same disease. It just, in this case, it happens to be attacking the salivary glands, the lacrimal glands. Okay. And uh, the connective tissues in the body folks, I hope you're kind of getting this, is, is people, just in our callers, the, the lecture that I gave you, it couldn't have been a better follow-up response than the people who've called and asked questions. This, this attacks you every place. You've described this to me, your blood vessels, your brain, you know, your joints, your thyroid gland, you're being, your whole body's being attacked. 
and you can't just you can't just like change one component of your diet and say, well, that'll take care of my my joints and it'll that'll take care of my joints and uh, I don't have to worry about my brain. You know, the same diet that takes care of your joints takes care of your brain. There's no selective foods out there that are specifically for the joints. You just got to fix the problem. The problem, I think I mentioned the problem. Yeah. Uh, people are asking if Lyme's disease is an autoimmune disease. No, it's an infectious disease due to a spirochete. Yeah, it's due to a spirochete. And uh, there are certainly, there, are, there are, uh, are antibody reactions that go on. The body attacks the, uh, the parasite. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, this is like, like uh, it's a spirochete. It's called a spirochete, like syphilis. And it attacks this spirochete and in the process you get inflammation going on in many parts of the body, like the joints and so on. And so, whereas, you know, the same story could be told about this spirochete, in other words, you just substitute a food for the spirochete and what happens is the body makes antibodies against this spirochete, but also finds similar tissues in your body and causes say inflammation of the joints. And so you get an arthritis with Lyme disease. It's very common, but you get a fever too. You know, you generally feel poor. It's affecting your whole body. Okay, thank you. So on with uh, what Margo says, she is got this uh, Hashimoto Sjogren's psoriasis rosacea, recently diagnosed with osteoporosis in her spine. She's five foot tall, 194 pounds, walks three miles almost every day, but works at a desk job, so more sedentary than she'd like. She wants to know how she can improve her bone health and lose weight. And are there foods to avoid other than gluten? Well, I hope, I hate to be so repetitious, but it's the same diet. You know, to lose the weight, to get the balls working, to help you with your various types of problems. It's a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. Why is that the same diet? Because that's a diet for human beings. That's what people eat. And so you need to fix the problem, which is people are eating an animal food-based diet, protein-based diet, calcium-based diet, junk food-based diet. It needs to be a starch-based diet, which is rice, or potatoes, or sweet potatoes, or corn, or wheat. You know, this, these are your foods. So, you know, you're 190 pounds at five foot tall. The first thing I tell you to do is stop walking around. You're going to destroy your joints. At that weight, your, your, your hips and your knees and your ankles are going to give out. Quit exercising. What about water exercise? Would that be good uh, for That's her? true. Thank you. Bicycling on a stationary bike, rowing and water that would be a good way to do it. I mean, start, stop exercising with, uh, with, uh, uh, with movements that will cause damage to your lower extremities. And those would be, you know, what she's doing, which is walking. So until you get down at five foot tall, you should be fewer than 100 pounds. That's what my November 2015 newsletter says under the Walter Kempner section. You'll be, a, listen, you have no choice. If, if I locked you up and I fed you the McDougal diet, even if I fed you all 4,000 recipes that we have published, you would lose the weight. You would get well. It always happens. Why does it always happen? It's because that's the problem. The problem's the food. I don't care whether you think good thoughts. I don't care whether you've been to church. I don't care whether you did not beat up your husband this week. I don't really care. All I wanted you to do is put the right food in your mouth. You'll get well. Isn't it nice you don't have to think good thoughts? I'd have a hard time helping people think good thoughts. That's funny. Thank you, Dr. McDougal. So I guess it's the food. Okay, we have a question from... Uh, Leah, and what's interesting is I actually know a person that this happens to. Her family and her have been starch-based for 10 years. For the last few years, we've had a problem of our noses running while eating. I've tried to eliminate foods in order to find some kind of allergy, but haven't been able to pin it down. Is this common? Do I need to do the elimination diet to figure it out? That's a brand new one for me. I, I, I can't really comment because I've never heard of this before. 
So it's obviously not common. Well, I don't know, maybe, maybe you should notice the foods that cause you to have the runny nose and just eliminate those. I, I, maybe it's the maybe it's a Pavlovian type of reaction, you know how Pavlo's dogs, when he rang the bell, they would salivate. Maybe just the idea of eating food causes your nose to run. Maybe I don't know. Interesting. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Let's see. We got more. This is from Christine. I've had many food allergies for a long time, making life difficult, especially if eating outside my own kitchen. One of my other symptoms is numbness in my feet. I'm in my early 60s, 60s have always been active and slim, but I've suffered from periodic binge eating over a 40 year period. Uh, but, um, these are long, let's see. Um, let's see, get to the question. Any ideas? Um, of how to solve this problem? Well, you know, initially from what she said, I think most doctors would come to the conclusion that she has a peripheral neuropathy. A peripheral neuropathy, which means that the, the joints, say in the periphery of the body, like in the feet, they have, uh, the, the nerves have become damaged. And so you get a burning sensation, a numbness, you know, lack of coordination. Yeah, it, because the nerves are damaged. Why are they damaged? Well, the most common, the most common thing you're told is diabetes, but it's really not diabetes. Again, it's a step back. It's the food, and one of the things about the food is that it results in high blood sugar levels, which may not be kind to the nerves. Anyway, uh, is it correctable? Can you fix it? Well, I, I gave you when I talked to you about the diabetes lecture. I gave you some work that was done at Weimar. And at Weimar, and I told you about them, they're the Seventh-day Adventist organization that's just east of Sacramento, California. And uh, what they found there is, I believe it was 24 people who had peripheral neuropathies, and most of them were due to diabetes. And 17 of them got better very shortly while they're at the program, which is just a few days. And they stayed better for four years. So Neil Bernard also had a study on peripheral neuropathy that I talked about in the diabetes lecture. So what you need to do is you need to take and look on YouTube or look in the McDougall channel and find the lecture that I gave uh, be probably four weeks ago on diabetes. And uh, you'll see the references to peripheral neuropathy in that lecture. Because she's saying she notices tingling in a lip and a couple of fingers too. So. Yeah. Uh, nice. you know, there, there, are, there are several things, but the initial thought would be a peripheral neuropathy. And, you know, there, there are lots of things that, that affect people, and it's just a guess. Well, thank you, Dr. McDougall, and thank you, Sherry. I'm getting a lot of super chats thanks to you, Dr. McDougall. Appreciate that. Carol says, is an autoimmune disease like psoriasis more influenced by high inflammation from body fat or foods such as dairy and gluten in the diet? Uh, it's a food problem. Psoriasis, uh, uh, um, if I ever give you the lecture on Walter Kempner, that's one of the diseases he enjoyed treating with psoriasis because they got better. But, uh, you know, Nathan Pritikin told me one time, he said, I've never seen anybody with psoriasis that didn't get better when they changed their diet. So I don't know that I have that experience. I couldn't make that statement. But yeah, you change, change what you eat. I've seen it over and over again, people with psoriasis of the skin and particularly psoriatic arthritis, which is a real, real painful arthritis. They get so well, so fast with the change in diet. Hey, I've challenged you. I, I offered you a test. Do what I suggest for four months. Strictly do what I say for four months. You're gonna get better in a week. Most of you will get better in a week. We run a 10 or 12 day program. That's because people get better in 10 or 12 days. You're not gonna solve all of the issues in 10 or 12 days, but you know, at least you'll be able to see over the horizon. You'll see there's a whole different life for you. It, it's, you deserve this. You deserve to feel good, function well. You deserve to be healthy and look good, really. And if you're not having those things, then you're following the wrong set of rules. 
I can guarantee you. Yeah, I can guarantee. I, I don't know what I'd put up for a bet or a money back guarantee, but I can pretty much guarantee you that if you change from the meat laden, dairy laden, oil laden, rich Western diet to the kind of diet I recommend, which is a starch based diet, you'll get better. You'll lose the weight. The balls will start working better. The joints will stop hurting. The blood sugar will come down. Isn't it amazing? So many things are fixed by one simple maneuver. And you'll also be helping the planet. Absolutely. Thank you. Margaret wants to know if diet can help Graves' disease. Well, Graves is where the, the, it is an autoimmune disease and it affects the eyes. That's where you usually see it. People have bulging eyes. I don't know. I can't say that I've seen people with the bulging eyes get better when they change their diet. But it's a, it's a thyroid disease related to, related to hypothyroidism, which manifests itself in terms of eye, eye bulging. Lots of other problems, but I, most notable is the eyes. Wow, thanks. And, and the thyroid gland is big too. You know, they have a big thyroid and they have bulging eyes. But again, this, this to be, I would, I would have to have more experience to tell you that it's gonna improve with the diet. I don't have that kind of experience with Graves. So I, I, I couldn't do it, but it doesn't mean, it, doesn't mean you shouldn't try. You know, it's, it's not gonna do you any harm. It's not gonna cost you anything. So why, why, why wouldn't you try it? I mean, if somebody offered you an opportunity to have a whole different life for free, and besides that, you were doing wonderful things for planet Earth and your community and your country. Why would you not do it? I agree. <laughs> this is a question from Ava, all the way from Israel. I'm a 71 year old woman. My diet is strictly whole foods and raw vegan. I've been strict for the past two years and was vegan on and off since my teens. Several years ago, my torso was covered with red patches that were diagnosed as a benign granuloma. But two years ago, I developed lichen sclerosis. I what? tweaked my diet to remove most gluten and oxidants. Skin conditions have improved dramatically, but I wanted to return to normal. What else can I do? Well, lichen sclerosis, which I believe is what she's talking about is a uh, primarily manifested as a skin condition. I've seen people get better. Uh, well, what you, could you do again, I taught you the best I know, was you start out with a basic McDougal diet, you go to gluten-free, which obviously has helped you. And then you do the elimination diet as a last resort or maybe water fasting. But I, I, I only tell you water fasting because they're gonna be an occasional person who just doesn't click. And maybe, maybe the people at, uh, at True North would help you. They have occasionally in the past helped my patients. Great, thank you. All right, uh, Susan wants to know if it's appropriate or accurate to call hypothyroidism an autoimmune disease. Yeah. I don't have Hashimoto's, no antibodies detected. So it's general hypothyroidism. Well, it could be due to other things. There's iodine deficiency, <laughs> which causes hypothyroidism. That's a common problem. Uh, but most, most of the people who are told they have hypothyroidism, they get a, an antibody test and they're told they have autoimmune thyroiditis. That's almost always the diagnosis. And so that's the most common condition, but sure you could, you know, the only other thing I can think of right now is iodine deficiency as far as commonly destroying the gland. And of course you correct that by just adding iodine. Nice, okay, let's see. Uh, here's a question from Lisa. If we're not supposed to eat wheat to help with autoimmune conditions, can we have a whole wheat or whole oat growth that are organic because they don't have glyphosate? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know, I don't, I, you kind of threw me a curveball then. Uh, I can't imagine why you know, there, are, there are certain kinds of wheat. I'd have to go back to the chart and show you. There are things that are called wheat, which are not high in gluten. But uh, I would be suspect of anything with wheat, barley, and rye in it. They also say oats uh, have a gluten issue, but it's because the tests were done in people who 
who uh, consumed oats that were originally manufactured in a plant where they manufactured wheat, barley, and rye products. So they were contaminated, but oats doesn't cause, it's not a high gluten food, it doesn't cause problems. But uh, I, I don't know what else you could do. Do you know, do you have a list of all the fibers? I think they mean grains without gluten. Uh, yeah, I showed it in the slides. It was, uh, it was a, a list of all that I knew at that time that the grains that didn't like amaranth and corn and rice and, you know, those are the things without wheat, barley and rye. So there are a whole list of them I gave them to you in the slide presentation, which is the nice thing about today's modern technology is you could go back and watch this show and you could stop it on the slide where I showed all the different uh, non-gluten starches that you can consume on the McDougall diet. But just think about it, potatoes and sweet potatoes. And, you know, that, that'd be good. Absolutely, thank you. Know, we've been having some, some bread fruit recipes. I should have Mary come over here and talk to you about it. Yeah, because there's a question on how to get stones out of millet. And I don't know because I've never well, seen any stones Mary, in millet. We can have Mary come over here. She's pretty good at getting stones out of millet. I didn't know millet had stones. Maybe the one I buy, I, I buy it in a bag and I've never seen a stone in it. Well, she's I guess got I'm lucky. Well, while we're waiting for Mary, here's a question on juvenile rheumatoid arthritis from Carol. She's okay. 63, was diagnosed with it when she was three. It mainly caused eye problems like uveitis, glaucoma, and yeah. cataracts. It burned out in her early 20s. In her late 20s, she was diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Are these autoimmune diseases related? Are all autoimmune diseases really the same disease just expressed differently? Yes. That's what I've been trying to tell you. Yes, yes, this is a systemic disease that affects your whole body. It's just that we name the disease based upon the organ most, most attacked, most evident. But yes, this inflammation is going on every place. It's attacking everything. The brain, the blood vessels, the nerves, the muscles, the joints. And, and some of them more specifically than others, but yeah, absolutely. Here's the stone guy, girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mary, there's a question. How, I didn't even know Millet had stones. I've never seen it. I've never seen a stone in Millet either. I've seen stones in beans. Yeah. So I, I always I, pick through my beans, but you know, the only thing I can suggest is just take a fine mesh strainer and pour your Millet into the strainer first so you can kind of um, go through it with your hands, you know, like this. You shouldn't be able to see anything that's not millet. Yeah, I know. I love millet. People, it's an underused grain, isn't it? People just. Yes, it is. It, it's um, something that I have a recipe in one of my very first books for millet loaf. And it used to be one of Heather's favorites. And it's it's great. It, it sticks together and you can make desserts out of it or breakfast or loaves. It's, um, it's a great grain. And it's, it's, it has a nutty flavor. Yeah, people think of it as bird seed. <laughs> well, well, it is. It is if you don't cook it. But it, when you cook it, it's, it's very it toothsome. I, I really like it. I wish my husband liked it because he doesn't. So I don't, I, he just wants to eat rice all the time. You know, John doesn't like it much either or quinoa. Same here. Those two could go out and eat together. Charles is exactly the same way. No, right? No, no millet, no quinoa. Yeah. That's so funny. We have to funny. expand their palate a bit, I think. <laughs> yeah. Everybody goes crazy for your bean pizza recipe. Oh, oh really? That's what I keep hearing. Oh, you should hear, you should, you should, you should give them a pitch on the, uh, on the bread, uh, the, uh, the jackfruit. Jackfruit. Oh, I tell you, we have had some really, really good recipes lately. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know what jackfruit is. Yeah, it's delicious. Do you get it in the can or do you get the dried? I get both ways. And which do we prefer? I think we prefer the one in the can. Do we? Well. Well, I, I like the one that you cook for a whole day. Yeah, that's the one that comes in the oh, can. Oh, they were so good. Yeah, it, it's like pulled pork when you yeah, when it, it when is, it comes it apart. Is. And, you know, I'll cook it for, instead of just one day, I put it in my slow cooker and I cook it on low for like two days and it all just pulls apart and falls apart. And then I, we put it on um, whole wheat burger buns with a coleslaw type 
um, mixture that I make. And, and, and uh, a little mustard. A little mustard and some sauteed onions. Yeah, saute. Oh, I can't forget those. I had that for lunch and for dinner the day before. Yeah. And tonight we're going to probably have bean pizzas. So. Oh, really? Yeah. I got beans going. Well, those are, you know, Mary, you should be, a, you should be a part of the show every time because, you know, Heather and AJ and a lot of the listeners out there, they get new ideas from you. Yeah. Well, See? Mary's, Mary's the, the original OG for low fat cuisine. She yeah. Is. She, Mary, Mary invented low fat vegan cooking. And I, I don't, I don't say that lightly. She really did. Back when we first started this back in the mid seventies. Oh. They had uh, low fat, which meant you had skim milk or you took the skin off your chicken. That was low fat. Well, or they had, remember those snack well cookies they used to have? Yeah, yeah, you could do it. It was all high sugar, low fat. And Entenmann's, yeah, they yeah. actually were really good. Yeah. <laughs> That's because you like sugar. No. I do. Any, anyway, uh, it, it, you know, at that time there was low fat and then there was vegan, which was vegetable swimming in oil. And so because of my, my needs, because my patients required a vegan, no fat diet, I asked Mary to reinvent cooking and she did. And she deserves credit for inventing <clears throat> low fat vegan cooking, which is very popular these days. There are all kinds of websites yeah, and books, lots of them. but it, it really came out of that experience. It was my needs and Mary's ability to to translate them into really excellent dishes. Uh, as I mentioned, we have nearly 4,000 recipes published. And some of them are a lot more complicated than others, but I usually try to keep it fairly simple because most people don't like to spend all day in the kitchen cooking. Why do you think people still resist the low fat message, Dr. McDougal and Mary? Because maybe does it take a while for them to enjoy the food? Because I've never seen a low fat diet not work in terms of weight loss, but people still argue about having to have so much fat. Well, I, you know, I, I don't have a simple answer for you. Uh, maybe that's the only cooking techniques they know. Maybe oil is very forgiving when it comes to cooking. You can you can cook almost anything in oil and it still turns out okay. Probably. You know, it's hard to burn. It's things. been so long since I've cooked in oil. I, I can't imagine. Certainly cooking people something don't with oil. think they need more fat to wear. I don't know why they keep doing that. I don't, I don't know why, AJ. I have to tell you, it's been very frustrating for me over the last half century. <laughs> I thought when, when Mary and I worked this out back in the early 70s, and we had it all figured out by 1977. I, I thought that there'd be people lining up all the way to, you know, all, all the way from the airport to my office to see me. And you're right. It's been a hard message to sell, but the truth's the truth and it's not going to change. I keep seeing unfortunately, more and more people are learning about it. <clears throat> yeah. Well, for the ones that do it, it works. I, there, I keep seeing a question about Epstein-Barr and MS connected. Epstein-Barr Epstein uh, causes mon mononucleosis. And it's been blamed for everything else, including chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. But it's an infection with a virus called Epstein-Barr virus. It, it's just, it, it's just a, it's something that's been used to blame diseases that we don't know the cause. And of course, when the disease, we don't know the cause, it's because you can't see the forest through the trees. So it's not an autoimmune disease, it's an infection. Well, it, 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 I suppose I have to clarify that when the body, say this, yeah, it is a virus. When the body, when the body gets exposed to a virus, like in this case, Epstein-Barr, it makes antibodies to that virus. And sometimes the antibodies made towards viruses, they cross react and they, they attack your own tissues. It's like, even after a flu shot, people will get uh, arthritis because the flu proteins that you had injected in you caused the body to make antibodies, which it's supposed to do against these, uh, these dead viruses or attenuated viruses. And because the antibodies are not specific, you will get systemic manifestations. But yes, just like with food proteins, viruses and parasites and bacteria and so on, they could be the initiating antigen, we call it, for the body to produce antibodies. And sometimes these antibodies cross-react with our own tissues. 
That's auto. That's the body attacking itself. That's autoimmune. So in a sense, yes, these are autoimmune problems, but not due to food. They're due to viruses with Epstein Barr. And they're due to food, you know, and if it was a virus, it would be something that would attack you on occasion. You get better, you get over viruses. This is a virus that you keep shoveling in your mouth three times a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This virus won't stop. It's called cow protein, pig protein, pig thyroids. It's not, you know, you just don't, it just keeps going on and on. You wonder why you stay sick, you never get well. You never gave your body a chance. Give it a chance. Come on, folks, give it four months. <laughs> I used to say, give it 12 days. That's why I wrote the 12-day program. That's why I used to run a 12-day program at St. Lena Hospital. That's why we run a 12-day program now over the internet. Because in 12 days, almost everybody gets it. And almost everybody shows dramatic improvement. You know, we get nearly 90% of people off their medications in, in 12 days. You tell me where you else you would have a chance to stop unnecessary drugs. And they're unnecessary because they were poorly prescribed in the first place. And secondarily, you got rid of the need for any medication. In other words, you cured the problem. Why wait? No. Time's going by. You only have a certain number of wonderful days ahead of you. You might as well, you might as well live them looking, feeling, and functioning your best. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Dr. McDougall, there's a question that was sent in by Mary, and she asked if you could please comment on all the reports that link low vitamin D levels to worse outcomes for COVID-19 infections. I know you don't recommend supplemental vitamin D under normal circumstances, but is this a new normal? I'd have to look at the research, but I can't imagine why taking vitamin D supplements would help with COVID-19. You know, you're not improving the general health of the body. You're creating nutritional imbalances. Uh, I don't know where the association came from, except for the fact that people, with, uh, people uh, who are most likely to get the severe consequences of COVID-19 are people who are sick from eating the Western diet. And uh, these people also, you know, pay less attention to healthy lifestyle habits like exercising out in the sunshine. I, I don't know how that association was made. It has to be a confounding factor though. And of course, everybody wants something as simple as uh, you can solve my problems with taking a vitamin D pill. You know, like Dr. Swank said in the lectures, people want to be fixed. When you have to fix yourself, it's a lot to ask. And Dr. Swank was saying that a hundred years ago. He'd be over a hundred years old now. So Dr. Swank was my friend. And he's one of my, he's one of my four mentors. And you can learn about my mentors by going to our website and you can look up Dennis Burkett, Nathan Pritikin, Walter Kepner, and Roy Swank. Those are the four men whose shoulders I stand on. Without their work, I wouldn't have learned. I wouldn't have come to these conclusions. You know, you just have the McDougall interpretation of some great, great people in the past that were really geniuses. They saw the problem, they saw the solution, and they didn't hesitate. Okay. Well, here's an interesting uh, question from Felicity from Australia. She was listening to someone, I, I, I'm, I don't know who these people are, Tom Bilyeu, and he had a guest on, Dr. Gabriel Leon, talked about you have to have animal protein to build muscle. Right, that's why everybody looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Because of all the muscle that they ate, they all got big like Arnie. Oh, oh come on. That's like, like saying you have to eat brains to be smart. Or how about, how about what do they, what do they call them? Uh, uh, well, then I guess we have to eat testicles. Oysters, of what are those oysters called? The sheep oh. oysters? Oh, Rocky Mountain oysters. Rocky Mountain oysters. We have to, we have hey, to what, what happens <laughs> if you eat Rocky Mountain oysters? You, are you going to end up uh, being a, a, a great big lover? I don't know. I'll well, see what you describe it without getting into trouble. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I suppose I could eat fingers and have be able to play the piano. Uh, you know, I mean, stupid. 
but that's the way people think, you know, eat muscle, grow muscle, eat brains, get smart, eat testicles, whatever. I wonder what happens if we eat liver. Mm. Yuck. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, actually eating testicles would give you a, a pretty good <laughs> dose of testosterone. So maybe that's a good idea. You know, so maybe there's some truth to that one. Certainly you could eat thyroid glands and get thyroid hormone. You could eat adrenal glands and get adrenal hormone. So maybe, maybe, maybe I, it, you know, sometimes a little bit of truth surface <laughs> surfaces when I never expected it to. What would make somebody's CRP always elevated? And is it possible to bring them down? They're saying the only time it was close to normal was after doing Walter Longo's Prolon diet, a fasting mimicking diet, which is a modified keto diet. Uh, C-reactive protein is, a, is the fever that you detect by taking a blood test. What I, what I say by this is this is a nonspecific protein that occurs as a consequence of inflammation. They try and make it more specific. There's a specific C-reactive protein, which is supposed to be related to the blood vessels, but it's still a very general marker. And so anything that causes inflammation, have I been talking about inflammation <laughs> this last hour and a half? Anything that causes inflammation will cause the C-reactive protein to go up. And uh, what you're looking at here with C-reactive protein is somebody constantly injuring the arteries with their fork and spoon. The arteries are constantly trying to heal. As a byproduct, they make C-reactive protein. Stop the injury, you'll stop the inflammation and the C-reactive protein will go down. It's been shown that eating the kind of diet I recommend, C-reactive protein numbers go down quickly. For, for the basic reason, you fix the problem. Mary, people are asking where they can find your bean pizza recipe. Joe said he searched and it didn't come up. You know, that's a good one. I don't, I, I actually don't know if, if, you ever if I it. ever written it. Go ahead, on. Mary, give them the bean pizza recipe. <laughs> well, you just use, you get a pizza crust, either you make it or you buy a healthy one there. And there are healthy ones in the stores, just the crust, whole wheat or. We chop at Freddie Meyers, so. No, we can find them there. Yeah, you can find them pretty much any place. I think you find them yeah. in Santa. Well, you can find them online too, actually. Yeah. And um, I just then I make a pot of pinto beans that I cook all day in my slow cooker, or you can cook them in the um, instant pot much much quicker, or you can use instant bean flakes. Um, Santa Fe Bean Company makes instant bean flakes that you make. They're just pinto beans that have been pre-cooked and they're made into flakes and you just mix them with water and they turn into refried beans with no fat or anything. And then you spread this on top of the pizza crust and then you put some salsa on top of that and some uh, green chilies. And I usually put some black olives on it and sometimes onions and then I put Let it- Let us too. Not until after. Oh, okay. Sure. And I bake it in the oven um, for about 12 minutes until right out right on the rack and take it out and then I top it with lettuce and tomatoes and avocado and it, some more salsa. It is so good. That's all. You know, it competes with any any pizza you ever had. Believe me. It's really, and I'm a real pizza guy. I'd have <laughs> killed myself for pepperoni pizza one day. <laughs> so you know that I'm a connoisseur. Yeah, it sounds it sounds incredible. It's really good. Yeah, it's, and it's really fast. The other thing you have to understand, AJ, is we've been, Mary and I have been eating this way for so long that we really desire simplicity uh, and the natural tastes of food. I know this is foreign, this concept to a lot of people because the food is so different, but you will adjust. You'll learn to like it. You'll learn to find this more flavorful, more enjoyable. And certainly a lot more positive reaction when yeah, I mean, we've been eating this way for 44 years at least at least so, so. other things don't even sound good to us anymore yeah. uh, believe me if we go to a, uh, you know get into a, uh, buy something in the store or end up going to a restaurant that has greasy food it's done you know yeah. it goes in the trash or we walk out of the restaurant after we pay the bill so uh, we just, uh, it's just so repulsive, the, the oil, the grease. I'm sure you noticed that, AJ, yourself. There's a question on goiter. Is That's not an autoimmune condition, is it? 
It is, yeah. It is. Uh, you know, goiter, uh, it's, we're talking about Graves' disease. Graves' disease is a, uh, a thyroid condition where you end up having a large thyroid gland and it becomes large because it tries to compensate for the fact that you're not making very much thyroid hormone. So it just works harder and harder and it gets huge. And part of the process involves producing antibodies against the eyes, which are the Graves disease. And I think I have that story for you. What, about, what about the iodine? Isn't that what causes them? Um, yeah, it could, iodine, iodine could cause goiter, absolutely. Yeah. Lack of iodine. Pardon me? Lack of iodine? Yeah, lack of iodine, yeah. Like, did I say too much iodine? No, you just said iodine. Yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> Mary, they're asking what pizza crust do you use? Do you want to see if there's one of the... Uh, I don't know. If, maybe I have some in the, in, the, in the cupboard just a minute. Yeah. That's great. While she's gone, Dr. McDougal, maybe you can talk about elevated triglycerides and lipoprotein A. Well, these are, these are risk factors that uh, have been more recently focused on. And I don't need to know these risk factors in my patients. Uh, total cholesterol is enough for me to know. But people go into fractions of cholesterol like HDL, LDL, MDL cholesterol, very low density lipoprotein cholesterol. They go into particle size, uh, lipoprotein A's, lipoprotein B's, all kinds of things. And this is just another way of describing uh, describing the, the, the problem that people have when they eat a rich diet is a whole bunch of things get wacko and they don't get in line. But I, as I say, I don't have to know these subfractions. I know enough about you just to know what your total cholesterol is. Did you reach goal? Well, I found, I found one that, um, it's not perfect, but it's the, the only one they had in the store that was pretty close. It's called rustic pizza crust. It's made with cauliflower and whole wheat flour. I've never seen that. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Let me see. You the know, first, I... first ingredient is cauliflower puree. So, but it doesn't taste like cauliflower when you eat it. Oh yeah. Okay. It's pretty good. That's cool. I've made my own crust, Mary, just using steamed cauliflower and like some Hannah yam and it came out pretty good. Oh yeah. Um, I think uh, there's a lot, you can actually buy, did you know this? You can actually buy um, in the frozen food department, you can buy riced cauliflower. Yeah. So it's already in, in small little things. So if you just mix it with something that sticks together, um, okay. it works fine. People want to know if you ever make your own seitan. No. We don't, um, I have, yeah, you have because, yeah. uh, but that uh, was a long time ago, man. I just wanted to see how, how you made it. So I can still remember sitting in the kitchen sink and, and, um, washing, the, washing the wheat. Yeah. <laughs> you were wheat washing. Yeah. Not white washing, but wheat you washing. Know, we don't really eat sea tan, so I don't make it. Yeah. And I don't buy it either. Yeah. Uh, Sherry wants to know, if you, oh, no, sorry, it wasn't Sherry, but Roller Girl, if you had any special foods that helped you through menopause and if you ever noticed your hair thinning. Did I even go through menopause? How would I know, Dr. McDougall, if I have no symptoms other than I don't get a period? Oh, it's because you ate well. I know. I, like, I don't know what people are talking about, they, these hot flashes. I'm in the desert. It's 100 degrees and I'm freezing. I'm, I would love a hot flash. <laughs> you, know, you know, AJ, the big people on the Western diet have hot flashes. I think I mentioned to you that you know, there's no word for hot flash in the Japanese language, or at least there wasn't after World War II until maybe recently there is. So people who ate like we do, did, never had a menopausal symptoms. You know, it's, it's a natural time of life. You're not supposed to get sick. This is the time all you do is you just stop making eggs. Yeah, I never had a hot flash. No. And my hair, still have lots of it. <laughs> You guys are great. You know, I, I actually, you know, we, we actually have a, a, a hair salon right below where we live. And every time we walk by there, I go, you know, maybe I should get my hair grayed a little bit. And Mary says, yeah, maybe you should. So what do you think? Should I get my hair gray? Do you think that maybe oh, I could? No, oh, it's gray enough. You need no, no, I mean brown. I mean brown. Like brown. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't need me anymore gray. I can do it streaked. Yeah, you can streak your hair. I'll tell you, if, 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 I ever, if I ever get to have a... a a big worldwide audience and I'm able to appear on stage. I'll get my hair dyed. 
Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I, I would do that. I would do that just to make a better, imp- uh, a better impression, you know, because you want to you want to look good for other people so that they are impressed with what you're doing. Otherwise, they're highly critical, AJ. The fact that I have all gray hair, I'm sure some people have commented on. Well, good grief. I'm in my mid 70s. I know people are really people are so mean on social media. And it's like and they're always the ones that you never see them. You know what I mean? You never see their picture, but they always criticize how we look. (laughs) <laughs> mainly they, mainly what I get is that you're both too thin. That's what I get. Oh yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've tried to deal with that recently. I think because of your conversations and one we've had with our patients, people will comment Mary and I are quite thin. I'm sure they do with you too, AJ. And so what I started uh, three weeks ago was I started a campaign to see whether or not I could gain weight. And so I got some trail mix, which is full of nuts and full of uh, dried fruits. And I've been trying to gain weight. And I want you to know, I want you to know, AJ, this is going to be important for you to know, is that I, in the last three weeks, have gained six pounds. Really? Yeah, nuts do do make you, I didn't didn't know what would work for me or not, but it works if you eat nuts and sugar together in the form of dry food. You mean fat and sugar in the same bite of food? (laughs) You you mix them together. And I I don't just, just eat one of those packs of nuts. I have two before lunch, two after lunch, <laughs> two before dinner. Two. A- I eat six of these packs a day. They have 250 calories a pack in them. <laughs> I've gained six pounds in three weeks. Are you kidding? That's two pounds a week. Yeah, well, I'm doing good. <laughs> I just have to keep the nuts up. So the trail milk, the trail mix has. Tell, is it a, is it a pre-made trails mix? Like, is it the Trader it's, Joe's it's, kind? It's the pre-made trail mix. It's got uh, sugar and. Uh, <laughs> And nuts. And hey, I'm going for the big time, man. I want dried go. fruit. Dried fruit, sugar. And, and, and some coconut slices. Is oh, that? my God. It's amazing that, that it happened and that nuts. quickly, Dr. McDougal, because somebody today was watching how they gained weight. If you could lose two pounds, gain two pounds a week, how much were you eating every day? Well, I, 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 I eat a lot of food. I mean, I eat. No, but how much of the nuts were you eating to gain oh, two I pounds? Told you, I, I ate six packs, uh, 200, 250 calories a pack. Wow. Now, if, do you pack. think if, if you had eaten that many calories extra from starch, you wouldn't have gained weight, right? No, no, no. I wouldn't. You had to eat the fat. But, but the people fat don't fat. believe this. And, and it drives me crazy when people think they have to eat nuts or they're going to drop dead. Every time I've seen people take nuts out, they lose weight. Yeah, really. You know, I, I gave you that. And when I gave the obesity lecture last week, two weeks ago, I. Uh, <clears throat> that's when you started to eat the nuts, right? Yeah, that's when I started to eat the nuts, right? Hmm. Yeah. Well, when you guys had birds, didn't you have more weight on yourselves? Oh, yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, sure. Because we, we had nuts in the house. Yeah, that was right. Now we fed our birds. So we ate them. <laughs> hey, this is an experiment. I'm doing this for you. <laughs> well, it's an experiment I appreciate because I don't want to do that experiment. Yeah, well, I, if I, if I, my goal is to gain 10 pounds at the end of a month. And I, I'm running out of my trail mix, so I got to get some more. Wow. It doesn't work on Charles. I feed him so much fat and this guy will not gain any weight. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. I thought I was condemned to that too, but I'm not. I can gain weight. I used to be I used to be 228 pounds, AJ. At my highest level, I was 228. That's 90 pounds more than I weigh now. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, be, people, I mean, they're, they're not people that you don't see, I used to work in nursing homes and you don't see a lot of obese people that are older. Oh, they're all dead. <laughs> they're all dead. That's just like, you don't see people, people older have high cholesterols because those with a uh, high cholesterol that meant something died. So cholesterol, uh, the way it is, is that when you, if you're an older person to have a high cholesterol, it shows no significance. Okay. Whereas a younger person, high cholesterol, predicts a higher risk of dying of heart disease. The reason is, is who in those people who cholesterol was an accurate predictor of what's going to happen to you, they're dead. And those who aren't, there wasn't a, a, an association, a realistic thing. They're still alive with the high cholesterols. So they're no thin, they're no overweight people. They're all dead. That's right. <laughs> they're all dead. You know, it, it's interesting that you could gain two pounds a week on nuts, not that you would ever eat oil, but do you think if you had used oil as the fat, it would, you would have just as much gain or maybe more? Well, I know, I know one thing is that, that the, that the reputation for a cruise ship, and we used to go on a lot of cruise ships, but we never ate at the midnight buffet. 
the, the reputation for a cruise ship is their average weight gain is 10 pounds in seven days. So that's in a week, 10 pounds. And that- But that, the cruise ships, we went on and served our food, so. Oh yeah, but we went on one or two that didn't serve our food. Yeah. Uh, the Alaskan, remember the Alaskan trip? Yeah. The Alaskan trip where both my dad and Mary's dad, <laughs> we caught him at the midnight buffet. Oh my God. We went on this Alaska trip. We took 200 and about 250 people on this ship that held 600 people. So well, that was at least 25 years ago. Yeah, at least. And, and uh, so we had 250 people along. We did our own cooking in the galley and, you know, went along pretty good until captain's night. And captain's night, they served lobster. I lost half of my patience that night. So I decided I wasn't going to do any mixed ships anymore. So after that, what we did is we only got ships that serves pure McDougal food. <laughs> and then, then we found a lot of our participants or not a lot of occasional participant was down in, down in the galley eating with the crew, smoking cigarettes too. <laughs> oh my God. And you know, it's, it's not a prison. It, it, it's like people you could just come and have some fun with us. That's all we cared about. Right. Mary, there's a question. Do you ever make broad food dishes? Raw food dishes? Yeah. Um, that we eat specifically as raw food, like salads? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, like raw food's like a thing. I know you guys didn't like that restaurant in Larkspur, Roxanne's, but I don't know if they mean like high-end raw food or, I mean, I'm sure you make salad. Well, yeah, very simple salads or coleslaw or something, but we don't, we don't spend a, a night eating <laughs> a raw food meal. Yeah. We like our food cooked. We like rice and potatoes. And um, our vegetables, we like them steamed or, or. It's pretty hard to eat raw when you eat the McDougal diet. Are you gonna eat raw, raw brown rice? <laughs> you know, you eat raw beans? I don't think so. Yeah. Maybe raw potatoes, but that's No, a, they're not very tasty. That's a tough job. You can, you can spiralize sweet potatoes and make like zoodles. Yeah. Those. Yeah. It, but, and, yeah, but you know, it's funny, Dr. McDougal, because I, I, I'm always, the, the few raw fooders I know that are successful, they, they, they love it. They seem to love their diet. I, I don't get it either because how do you eat without starch? But I don't know either. Yeah. No question. They're eating the nuts and the dried fruits because otherwise they couldn't keep their calories on. They couldn't keep their weight on. So these raw fooders, just like the <clears throat> Larkspur experience we talked about, these raw fooders are, are substituting with a lot of calorie dense foods like nuts and seeds and avocados and nut butters those kind of things. Wow. You know, they, they look, they don't, you don't beat the law of thermodynamics, you know, which is calories in versus calories out. So if you find somebody who's walking around as a raw fooder and they're looking pretty good, not like a bean pole, then you know that they're slipping in nuts and seeds and avocados and nut butters that they couldn't do. Oh, that. those are considered raw food. Raw food, sure. Yeah. yeah. Mary, they want to know, do you have a skincare routine? Um, not really. Not bad for a mid seventies, <laughs> is she? <laughs> I've been using um, Shakai lotion for my whole. I mean, as long as I can remember, and I don't. I don't. I'd never wear makeup. I just, yeah, you've, you've never worn it your whole life, not even like at your wedding or a special occasion. Oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm probably at my wedding, and for a special occasion, I would. Or for when I did a big TV show, they would put makeup on me, but. Um, in general, no. When when you see me in person, all I have is just uh, skin cream on my face. Wow, that's really amazing. Not, not not even a little lipstick, lip gloss, none of that. But lip gloss. Once in a while, when I'm on a, doing this, I have a little lip gloss on, but it's oh. not very dark. That's so cool. I did not know that. Excellent. And Vicky wants to know what's your favorite dish. We know what Dr. McDougal's is, but I don't know if we know what yours is. I don't know if I have a favorite. We, we, um, do, do I, uh, I know you, you're picking on potatoes as one of my favorite dishes, but I like so many different things, AJ. Uh, it was really hard. I really me. like jackfruit. What are those jackfruit? We've, we've been eating a lot of jackfruit lately. Let's see well, I don't know that I have a favorite dish. You know, you can use jackfruit like to make a chicken noodle soup, but the yeah. jackfruit's like the chicken and the noodles are like zoodles. It's pretty good stuff. You can use soy curls for that too it's good there people are asking if you guys are gluten-free you're not gluten-free you don't need to be no. no we have been at times we, we've gone through we've also followed the elimination diet you know we've done pretty much everything we ask you to do just so we knew what you were going through 
So we, uh, we had uh, one of our children had uh, a lot of allergies, which were due to us living close to the mountains with all kinds of moisture and fungi and stuff growing. But uh, in an attempt to help him get better, we went on a gluten-free diet. And it was not a big deal. We also went on an all potato diet for two weeks where all we ate was potatoes and water for two weeks. Except, <laughs> believe me, we're, 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 a, we're a full service <laughs> company. We, oh, that's why you're eating the nuts, right? Yeah, I, I'm right. I, that's for, believe me, it is for you because <laughs> I don't really like these. So when you uh, did all potatoes for two weeks, did you lose weight? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we 10 did. pounds 10 each. 10 pounds each. Oh my God. That's incredible. I, I don't, I don't want, I, I don't want, that just sounds so interesting. I, I don't, did you, did you eat the same potato or just any kind of potato? No, oh, we, we ate, well, uh, they were just white potatoes. And we, I'd make hashed browns for breakfast and then we'd have baked potatoes for lunch and I'd make mashed potatoes for dinner. And no, no sauce, nothing, just the potatoes. No, well, we, I, I had some green, um, green salad vegetables with it and uh, some condiments like salsa and things like that. I never, how long ago did you guys do that? These are all these interesting Uh, things that we don't know about you. No, it was, uh, Patrick is almost 45. Yeah. So it'd be 40 years ago, probably 40, 35 to 40 years ago. That is amazing. (laughs) Yeah, well, I can still remember. You know, AJ, I, as a young medical student, I used to take all the medications that I prescribed for my patients. You know, I didn't have heart bypass surgery, to find <laughs> out what that was like, but I did have a sigmoid exam where, you know, I was going to stick this silver tube up your butt without me trying it first. Mm, that was an experiment I'll never repeat. Uh, anyway, I, I, I felt like it was necessary for me if I'm going to prescribe these things to you they really have a good understanding of what I'm doing. And so, like I say, I've tried pretty much to, to in some way or another, to emulate the, the recommendations that I would offer you uh, by doing them myself to see what their real value is. Yeah, we really do eat the McDougal diet, if you have any <laughs> doubt. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a post, I hate to get involved in this, but somebody says, Dr. Greger is still talking crap about white potatoes. I know, I know. You know, and to, unless he comes out and says something bad about McDougal, he'll be left alone. But he's not going to say bad things about, about our program and get away with it. Any of you who want to see that, it's on YouTube. It's just look up McDougal and Gregor. And you'll see a thorough discussion that I had to have with Michael Gregor because he said some terrible things, which were untrue. And you know what? He's left it unanswered. I'm waiting for him to come back and say, well, this is my point of view. You, you left this out. I don't think he's going to do that. I think I thoroughly <laughs> dealt with him, but you decide. You go watch uh, the AJ show of Dr. Gregor and McDougal, and you decide whether I handled him in a very professional and profound way, which will cause him to never do that again. He will never say anything bad about McDougal again, I guarantee you. Or he can plan on having <laughs> full force. Well, they're, they're referring to the old things he said about potatoes i'm sure no 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 he's, he's coming out with new still, oh yeah oh he's potatoes? hey i guess he's, he's maybe i heard his feelings oh well, maybe i don't know but yeah you're right I've, I've seen a couple of his lectures have been focused on saying bad things about the potato maligning the potato i don't like that but unless he, he can pick on the potato all he wants but you better not pick on the mcdougals <laughs> then you then you're asking for trouble buddy i'll work hard i'll walk day and night to show you what i really think as I did for that presentation. I worked really hard to put that presentation uh, together for Dr. Greger, but uh, somehow he seems to be a slow learner. I don't know what the <laughs> heck the problem is, but anyway, he's, he's a friend. He's a professional friend. I think a lot of the, Dr. Michael Greger, he just can't control his lips sometime, I guess. He said some things that he shouldn't have said. Whether he regrets it or not is up to him, but I can tell you, I thoroughly dealt with all the negative things he said. Watch, watch the interview. Yep, it's a very good one. I can link to that. Uh, Mary, people are asking what kind of jackfruit you buy. Do you buy the Trader Joe's brand? I know they sell it. No, I buy it from. I buy it off Amazon. So I don't know what brand it is, but it's just jackfruit um, in brine. So I have to soak it first to get the the extra salt off that they pack it in, and then I drain it and rinse it really well with water before I put it in my uh, crock pot. 
Oh, very nice. People most, are, most grocery stores have jackfruit now, at least up here in Portland. Yeah. And they sell it at Trader Joe's. Oh, okay. Well, it's probably the same thing. Yeah, it's, just, it's in a can, like 15 or 16 yeah. ounces, something like that. Yeah. Well, I bet I can, before you answer, I think I know the answer. They're asking what your go-to breakfast is, and I'm guessing it's oatmeal, and maybe it has some blueberries in it, and maybe Mary's has some brown sugar on it. I'm guessing that's what it is. You got it. Yeah, you got it. We, <laughs> we, we buy oatmeal in bags that are, are they 20 or 40 pounds? I don't know. They're big. They, they're 40 yeah, pounds. Probably. Yeah, probably 40 no, pounds. They're huge. <laughs> that's how I buy the oatmeal. And I go in uh, about once a week and I fill up a smaller container from these big bags. We have oatmeal every morning for breakfast. I uh, just, for, so, you, just so you know, I'm a cook. I'll tell you how I make it. I take two and a half cups of oatmeal <laughs> and I put it in about that much water and then I cook it. And that's, it turns out really good every time. I throw some nuts in these days. I've been throwing some nuts into the, my oatmeal in the morning and uh, we put a little dried fruit or not dried frozen fruit on it. We put, we buy frozen fruit at the grocery store, which is just plain fruit. And uh, that makes a really, really nice addition to my oatmeal. Yeah. People are asking if you ever eat savory oats. Oh, do I ever? No. Eat? no. So you never made savory oats, Mary? Just I know. I, I think I've tried them once or twice and we weren't that fond of them. So, you know, we go back to sweet oats. And I have a banana. I have a, I, I, I have a raw food. I have a raw banana. In, <laughs> so I do eat raw food. So I throw a raw banana in my oatmeal. It's not, see, you thought I was just, I was just a, a, a casual cook that didn't have a lot of talent. <laughs> Not only do I throw dried fruits in my bowl, I also throw uh, frozen, raw, frozen, fruits. Fr 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 frozen fruits. I also throw a raw banana in there. Pretty good, huh? Yep. <laughs> Here's a nice comment. People can say what they want about potatoes, but you'll never be hungry after eating potatoes. I love the feeling of truly feeling full and content. So we, That's yeah. true. Potatoes are the most satisfying of all foods. I, I couldn't agree gonna, more. You just, I, I, just that was our that was our dinner last night. Your favorite meal, the AJ was sweet potatoes and broccoli. Yeah, I, I just don't get tired of it. Sometimes I though eat chopped salad instead of the broccoli, but I, and I, I don't know, they're just so good. I, I mean, I, I look forward to them every day. Well, don't you also look forward to getting up every day and thinking this is going to be a great day? I feel so good. You know, I don't. I, I I used to maybe in many years back, but I know a lot of people wake up with impending doom. And they live the whole day thinking some really negative thoughts about their health and their ability to function and the way they look and so on. Aren't you tired of that? You know, I bet, I bet there's not a day that goes by that you don't have at the end of the day, say to Charles, you know, it was another great day, Charles. I'm just guessing. We're just so tired by the time we go to bed. We were. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you get up in the morning and you say that. I, I always say to Mary, I can hardly wait till she gets up in the morning. I always say good morning. Oh. <laughs> How are you today? And just, you know, anyway. Obviously he gets up first. Yeah, I get up a yeah. lot earlier. Yeah. So here's another autoimmune question from Lisa. Have you ever heard of someone getting off thyroid medication after they've been on it for many years? Only if they were put on by mistake. A lot of people are put on by mistake. They're put on because they're tired or they're having trouble losing weight. So the doctor will let a, you know, inappropriately not practicing good medicine will put the person on thyroid medicine when their thyroid is still functioning. No, in that circumstance, yes, you can get off thyroid medication, but if it's really a destroyed thyroid, it's not coming back. You're going to need the supplement. It's a great treatment because it's one of the few supplements treatments that I give that has almost no side effects and when properly prescribed is all positive. It's a good drug and very necessary because your thyroid gland's not working. You'd be sick if you didn't have this supplement. Oh, yeah. Don't throw the baby out with the wash water. There are a lot of good things in medicine. Just when it comes to chronic diseases and autoimmune diseases and heart disease and cancer and diabetes and like 90% of the things they're doing is wrong. I think so. I, I would like the, I'd like you to tell uh, your, your friends and your doctors and your scientists, and your dietitians that I think they're wrong. And please meet me on AJ's show to tell me that I'm wrong. 
it's, it's so hard being a patient if you go to a regular doctor or Dr. McDougall. And sometimes you have to, I mean, you, you don't have to go, but you know what I mean? It's just really hard. Well, we, we, we do everything we can to avoid that. And uh, it's, it's really been a rare time when Mary and I have seen a doctor, but we've been forced, we've been lucky, you know, we've been in good health. We've had a few tragedies that have caused us to avail ourselves to the medical profession, but these were not related to, to our diet. <laughs> Uh, Faith wants to know how old you guys are. Well, so, I'm 75. Almost 76. Wow. Oh, so, yeah, sorry, almost sorry, almost 76. <laughs> Should be 76 in a few days. No, a few months. April 30th. Less That's so. right. That's two months away. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I'm younger. That's you. Listen, you ought to pay attention. He's, he's I'm only younger. 74. I'm, I'm, I'm older than Charles too. It's like we live parallel lives, the two of us. Well, I needed an older woman to help me. You know, I needed somebody with experience and good judgment to keep me out of trouble. What are your thoughts on Armour Thyroid? That's the one that's made from animals, right? It stinks. Yeah. Don't take it. If you stick your nose in the bottle, you'll know what I'm talking about. It stinks. It smells like dead animals. And it carries, uh, it carries microbes with it, viruses and prions and, you know, things that give people infections. So don't do it, you know, take Synthroid. It's also been questioned about its reliability. I don't know that that's really the case. I, I would not eat it because it's full, of, uh, it's full of leukemia viruses and cancer causing viruses and, and mad cow prions and it's just, it's dirty. It's a, it's a dirty thyroid gland from a stinky old cow that got slaughtered in a stinky old slaughterhouse full of feces. <laughs> hey, JJ, well, we've probably done this one to the, you know, maybe we should let you go. Okay. Whenever you want. I mean, it's really hard to hang up on you guys. So we can, we can go anytime. Cause you know, you, you probably let's, don't let's, know. Let's, we, we can wait until, until Craig and me could come over to pick up the cats. How's that? You want to wait? Yeah. Sure. wait are you babysitting cats? We yeah. are babysitting the cats. And you know, that means we have meat in the house, but you know what? I haven't been tempted. Oh, okay, Dr. McDougal, can I say something? Cause I had asked you something once and, and how you felt about lab grown meat. And you thought it was a bad idea because people were still eating meat. But what I never got to say is the reason I was interested in lab grown meat is for people that have, that are vegan, that have cats, th that would be a more humane option. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. I, I can understand that. Sure. It would be, it, I think it would be more consistent with your beliefs, not only for yourself, but for the planet to, to use these fake meats. Be, and, and, you know, I think that's, that's fine, except that they're not promoting them just to feed your cats. They're promoting them as a worldwide solution to climate change. And that's never going to happen. Yeah. You know, you're never going to be able to produce uh, these fake meats and that kind of. I can't make enough of them. Yeah, we're not going to be able to do that. And, yeah. you know, I could get people to eat them in the second place. And uh, Jan wants to know when your birthday is, Doctor McDougall, and I believe it's uh, eight, uh, wait May May seventeenth. That's yeah. right. And guess what? I've kept that day open just in case, just in <laughs> case somebody wants to come on. I didn't book a guest. Well, you know what? Uh, yeah, I, I, I you know, the problem with being in your mid seventies is you feel like you're in your mid forties. That's, that's the problem that, you know, I have no idea that I'm in my mid seventies until I was, you remind me of it. <laughs> Even looking in the mirror, I don't look back at a 70 year old. Well, but that's probably because my vision's <laughs> bad, right? <laughs> I clean my glasses. Uh, I, you know, I really, I, I have to say, uh, when I was younger, I used to look to these years as being difficult years and very little enjoyment and you know because i was around sick people when i was growing up uh, being 70 years old meant that you were disabled or dead almost dead so I, you know we're living in a whole different uh whole different circumstances is we love getting up in the morning we love for going for our walks we look forward to our meals and our time together and if it keeps feeling this good i'll just keep going <laughs> Like I could live to be a hundred, doubt it. <laughs> well, that, so Faith says, what do you guys do for exercise? Walk. Yeah, we walk. We have some favorite destinations. This, this summer, we're going to probably pick some restaurants that are four or five miles away from our house. Right now, we pick on restaurants that are about two miles away. 
Right. And I can't, I can't find the name of the person that asked, but I saw a question. Do either of you do anything like sunscreen when you go outside? Uh, I have sunscreen in my face, in my face cream, but that's all. When I, when I windsurf, which I haven't done in too long, and then you put, you put, then I put on. a load of sunscreen on me because, you know, even though I wear a helmet and I'm pretty well dressed because I windsurf in the cold ocean. You know, my face it gets uh, burnt, and so yeah, I, I put a lot of sunscreen on. Otherwise, in in the midsummer here in Portland, we wear hats that yeah. cover our faces. But at this time of year, we don't need anything like that. Yeah, we don't. I don't think we'd be rare that we would go to Hood River, watch Craig uh, kite surf, or we'd probably put a little sunscreen in. Maybe. I don't, I'm not going to let my skin get burnt anymore. I, I mistreated myself so much so when I was invincible. Back in the old days when I was invincible. We put sunscreen on the grandkids. Yeah. yeah. Do you manage to avoid oil when you go to restaurants, asks Lisa. We try. We don't go to restaurants. <laughs> you just said we walk to restaurants. Oh, yeah, I did, didn't I? <laughs> I didn't say we eat there. Yeah, we're, we're, you know, we, we, we walk to only restaurants that serve healthy food. <laughs> and that's the truth. It is. Yeah, we don't, you know, we'll go to any old restaurant. We go to, there's some Thai restaurants and. There's some great, great um, vegan and healthy food restaurants in Portland that are downtown, which aren't too far away from where we live. So we can walk there and um, get a bowl of pho or um, other uh, noodle dishes. Um, yeah, so a few good Mexican restaurants yeah, downtown. A few, very few. But we really eat all, all, all very but, seldom. food is so much better at home. This is the thing that people don't understand that always wanting to go to restaurants. I think my food's better. Well, well you know what the problem is, is um, AJ, is they, they feel like they have to cook a whole lot of food to make it look like, you know, their table's filled with a lot of stuff instead of realizing they can keep it simple and just cook a bunch of potatoes or, or make three bean pizzas and it'll taste much better than if they went out and it hardly takes any more time than getting in your car and going someplace. And it's cheaper. And the problem I have is I'm a volume eater. And I, when I go to restaurants, I need to order two or three entrees. They don't give you enough food at restaurants. No. Well, they also, you know, they're used to dealing with the regular customer who was used to a high salt high sugar palate. And unless, unless you know, there's a, a tablespoon of salt on the surface of the food, they think they're being deprived <laughs> because they're so adapted to, and so when we go in and eat, commonly I'll, I'll say to Mary, you know, I'll never come back here again because it's just too loaded with sodium salt. It doesn't taste good. So I'm not worried about my health by downing a whole, a, whole, a, a salty meal. I just don't like it. Yeah, same here. Question, do either of you do any weight training or resistance exercises? Not lately. No, we, no, did. we did. We did up until, up until COVID hit. We actually had somebody who would come to our home once or twice a week and guide us in some exercises. But since COVID, we've kind of cut that out. Maybe we should start again. Could our muscles it. looking a little weak. You could do it on Zoom even these days. Yeah, yeah sure. Could, yeah. And Karen says, Dr. McDougall, do you have to be careful with exercise because having had a stroke? Uh, well, that's that's kind of an interesting statement. I've been I've been limping around and had weakness since I was 18 years old. So that's 50 some years, 53, 55 years. And you know, I've had I've had to be a little bit more careful. Uh, maybe I've been too cautious at times and used my disability as an excuse for not doing certain things, but. I've also tried to be adventuresome. Uh, you know, I, I love to do exciting things that are somewhat dangerous, like windsurf in the ocean and, and take ocean going sailboats, which Mary and I and the kids used to do all over the, all over the place or fly airplanes. We flew airplanes for many years and, you know, those are somewhat dangerous habits and sports and <laughs> hobbies. And so I, I guess I'm just a little, little cautious. Uh, anyway, uh, probably not. I probably have, have not had to be very cautious, but I have a significant disability uh, in terms of my, 
my my uh, no, weakness. Like uh, very few people seem to notice it. Mary seems to think I'm okay. And often people will say to me after they've known me for a while, they'll say, did you hurt your leg? And I'll have to go into the whole story about how I had a massive stroke when I was 18. And I walked this way for a long time. What does a stroke feel like, Dr. McDougall? Like what I, I want, like, does it, do you feel anything when you're having no, a stroke? Perfect, perfect sensation. It's just a co coordination and, and strength. That's all. It just had just about the, the muscle part. But, I, but I'm a, a little bit more careful about, uh, you know, about not hurting myself, I suppose. I think she meant, what, is, what does it feel like when you have the stroke? Oh, but it, oh, no, I have no sensation at all. It doesn't hurt. My, my joints on that side, I predicted when I did this that because of the imbalances created, the mechanical imbalances created by the stroke, that I have terrible arthritis when I got to be my age. I didn't expect the joints on the left side of my body to be working at all. And they're perfect, absolutely perfect. In fact, I've had uh, no joint problems on the left side, which is where the stroke was. And I've had significant problems on the right side due to injuries. It's probably because that's where I, you know, that's where I'll push myself is on the right side of my body. So I've had right hip and right shoulder and, you know, those, those kinds of temporary problems, so, but never the left side of my body. It's just, it's been, it's been real good to me. <laughs> Not that I'd want to, to do that again, but as you've heard me say many times, I'd never be the doctor that I am today if it wasn't for the stroke I had. That would have been my last question. Angela says, do you know the name of the sunscreen you use? No. Just plain old sunscreen. I don't know. I don't know. I have it in the, in the cupboard. That's okay. <clears throat> I think yeah. maybe Simple Earth or something like that. Yep. Uh, Carrie Ann says, how much starch makes up your meals? Do you do the 50-50 plate method? I'm going to guess um, no. no. No, absolutely not. But 90% of our... 90% of our meal is starch. In fact, Mary made a, a rice dish two nights ago, which she'd been making with a double batch of vegetables. And, uh, you know, when she made it that way a couple of weeks ago, I asked her if she'd just, you know, put one bag of vegetables in and put an extra bag of rice in. You know, it was so much better, you know, <laughs> doing it that way. No, it, the, you've got to have the starch or it's not going to be satisfying. You're not going to walk away from your meal thinking that, that I really ate. The vegetables are side dishes. They're they're interesting. They're colorful. You know. Yeah, it makes our rice dish look. Yeah, it makes, makes it look pretty. It makes the rice pretty. But I do. <laughs> we just eat the broccoli and enjoy it. It's not that we don't eat it. It's just that you need to have starch as the centerpiece, or you're, it's not going to work for you. If you're still trying to be a vegan or a vegetarian, it's not going to work for you. You've got to eat a starch-based diet, which is a traditional diet, which is the diet that 99.99% of people who have walked this earth have consumed, whether it be corn for the Native Americans and the Aztecs and the Mayans, whether it be potatoes for the Incas, whether it be bread for people living in the breadbasket of the world, in other words, the Middle East, whether it be rice for Asia, it doesn't matter what starch you pick. In fact, there are thousands of starches out there that I've even not even heard of that have existed throughout history that people have uh, taken advantage of for their village, their community. It's always been starch, always been starch, except if you lived on the extremes of the environment, like where the Inuit Eskimo lives, or you, or you belong to some cult like the Maasai Indians do and the, who, who live in, uh, in Africa. They have kind of a cult thing going where they live on blood, meat, and milk. It's cult. <laughs> Sounds terrible. Charles says, what does your tattoo say? Whose tattoo? Your tattoo. Well, didn't you say, don't oh, you have one on, on my chest? Mm. I, oh, I forgot my do friend. Not, do not cast. Do not I cast, sue. I will sue. You'll see pictures of that. It's, it's, it's on our website, do not cast, I will sue. I've even got pictures of my grandkids with a similar tattoo. And they were like six and eight years old. <laughs> We should show that sometime. <laughs> we should. Yeah, it, yeah. It's it's it was an it was a uh, yes. It's a nice tattoo. <laughs> Do not cat. I will sue. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Otherwise, I was looking for that tattoo. <laughs> you know, that yeah. is hilarious. 
So Dr. McDougall, somebody had asked about, I I could never go to medical school, just the words ankle, you know, ankle. Ankylosing spondylitis. Thank you. (laughs) And they said that when they eat this diet, they get too gassy and bloated and their stomach hurts. So Okay, well, that's that's a separate problem. Ankylosing spondylitis, as I showed you when you rewatched the lecture, did not exist in Africa back before 1970. Okay, so ankylosing spondylitis is just one of the inflammatory arthritis like lupus or rheumatoid or psoriatic. You don't have to call it ankylosing spondylitis. You call it ankylosing spondylitis because it involves the central joints, the big joints, as opposed to the peripheral joints. It involves the joints of the pelvis, of your spinal column. That's why you call it ankylosing spondylitis. It's the same disease, same cause, same treatment implications, same response to diet. Okay, so you're getting gassy. Come on, Mary, tell them how to degas. Yeah, tell them don't eat it. Don't eat as many beans. That's usually the culprit. And or so, the cruciferous, maybe the cruciferous vegetables sometimes for vegetables people too. Yeah, but, but beans I find mostly. Um, so cook your beans thoroughly, or degas them by soaking them overnight and then letting them sprout. Um, on a baking tray yeah. for, for a while. And then that takes care of the gas. Yep. I just can't eat them at all. I haven't eaten legumes in like 10 years. And boy, I, I just think. Really? Yeah. Is that beans or cruciferous vegetables? No, cr- I can't eat beans, split peas, lentils. I get like, I get violently ill and, and it's just, and you know, and now, you know, I'm going to, p- people feel the same thing about beans as nuts that if you don't eat them, you're going to drop dead. But I eat plenty of starch, just not from that one category. AJ, you might try Mary's technique of sprouting the beans, peas, and lentils first. And then, you know, she, she soaks them for 12 hours, sprouts them for 12 hours. After they start to make the little sprout come out of the bean, then she cooks them. And then we found that 100% effective. We, we have people who won't eat beans unless they sprout them first. So you might be able to add beans, peas, and lentils just as an enjoyment factor, no, nothing nutrition-wise by using the sprouting technique to get rid of the sugars that are in beans. There are a couple of sugars in beans that you can't digest. We don't have the enzymes in our small intestine, but bacteria have the enzymes to digest these sugars. So when the beans end up, you know, the mashed beans, the what's left of the beans ends up in the large intestine, the bacteria, they digest the beans, that sugar. And when you digest sugar, one of the byproducts is gas. Right. Gina says, is do not calf different than do not resuscitate? You don't have a DNR, right? I don't have a DNR. It's just do not calf, right? Do not calf. Do not calf. I will sue. That's because if you go into the hospital for anything, before they'll do anything to you, they think they have to do a heart calf on you to see if your heart can stand what they're going to do to you. Yeah, really. It's part of of the business pitch is that before they can (laughs) study you to fix your broken leg, they have to do, they a, have hard to do, do a hard cath on you to see what your coronary arteries look like. It's just, it's just bizarre. <clears throat> it's called prophylactic revascularization. It should have been outlawed in 2004. In the year 2004, the New England Journal of Medicine published the classic article that showed that studying people and treating their heart arteries prior to any non-cardiac surgery, like a broken bone or a hip replacement or a cancer, does not advantage the patient. They're hurt by doing this. They should have stopped doing it 18 years ago. 2004 is 18 years, six, eight. No, that's no. longer than that. Let's yeah, about 18. It's 18 years? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, it's a long time. <laughs> long time ago, they should have stopped doing it. But you know what? Doctors don't respond to the science unless it's, it's profitable. And then they're all over it. Oh, just tell me more. Teach me more. Oh, I got to buy one of those gadgets. Uh, how does it improve my improve my practice? They're people. The doctors are people. They act like other people. They're oriented towards profits. You know, heck with the with the customer getting in the way. People are asking if there's a way to exactly, act. Oh, sorry. I don't exactly feel that way, AJ. I just a little bit joke that way because of how mistreated patients are. But I think most doctors went to medical school with the intention of helping people. They just got sidetracked. 
and uh, they forgot why 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 they were given the honor of, of being a doctor. It's an honor to be a doctor. It it should be a coveted place in our society. There's a reason that doctors have a good reputation. Um, they used to deserve it. They don't deserve it anymore because they've been taken over by the drug industry and the device industries, and they have uh, they've been been persuaded to be dishonest. And you know about dishonesty. You know about big fat liars, right? You heard about liars, right? They're all over the place. Well, they're in the medical business too. And you know what? They do it for the same reasons that politicians do it. Power and money. People are asking if there's a way to access your sprouting technique, Mary. Is there a video? Or... Um, no, but it, it's in the, um, the McDougal program book. There's a whole page on how to do it. Okay, great. And, and they're I'm asking... I'm not oh. sure if it's... Um, if we have it online someplace, I, I imagine we do. So just go to our website and- I, I bet you can look up under YouTube, how to sprout beans. And I bet there's a YouTube already. There probably it. is. It's, easy, it's, you know, the way you've described it, Mary, I mean, how could anybody well, miss? Well, it's, it's really easy. You just take the beans and you soak them in plenty of cold water so that they're gonna, because they're gonna expand in size. So it's gotta be a lot of water over the beans and you soak them for 12 hours. And then you strain the beans into, into a pot and get all the water off them and lay them out flat in a baking dish or two, however many you have, that has a really lightly damp paper towel on the bottom of it. And you spread your beans out on top of that and then you let them sit on the counter for another 12 hours. And they'll sprout just a little tiny white sprout that you can hardly see. They're not going to grow these little green things and stuff. It's just going to be a little white sprout. But when they when they make the sprout, they use up the sugar that we can't digest very well. And it takes care of the gas problem. And people are asking, what spices do you guys like to put on your potatoes and vegetables? Oh, salt. Salt. <laughs> I have this great, my favorite, but, but one of just, my favorites. Just a little, little tiny bit of salt on the, on the surface of the food. But I like to season things with that. Um, the Kirkland 21, organic 21 seasoning mixture. And you can buy it on Amazon or at Costco. Yeah, we use some Mexican hot sauces. Yeah. Uh, we're not big spice people, I'm sorry. You know, we don't have an ethnic origin like a Thai-in or, or Well, we Thai use, or, um, what? And the one we make, the when Craig makes his noodle soup, we use togarashi, okay. which is the Japanese spice mixture. And um, so I guess we're a lot more sophisticated than I thought. Yeah. yeah. Soy sauce, rice vinegar, some some Japanese and Chinese um, flavors because we mm. like noodles and rice. <laughs> like the sweet potatoes we had last night, it was just plain sweet potatoes. And uh, broccoli, there was just plain broccoli. Yeah. You know, that's how I ate, I ate, my, I ate most of my, I mean, we had a little peanut sauce out there, but- well, You didn't eat very much. No, I, I, I like the plain food. Yeah, it's delicious. How often do you guys eat dessert? Never. Mm, pretty much never. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> let's, let's put it this way, AJ, as long as we have willpower, when we go to the grocery store, we don't eat dessert because there are certain sections of the grocery store that pull on us just like they pull on you. And uh, those in particular, what, we've, our, what our latest challenge has been, and we've been successful at least for six months, if not for a year, is when you walk down the non-dairy ice cream aisle. Ho, ho, I want to, <laughs> we almost don't go down that aisle anymore or we go down with blinders on because I'll tell you, those ice creams, <laughs> they jump in your grocery cart and they're there for good until you eat them. So, so we don't buy, we just, we just don't, we just we don't, don't buy, buy anything stuff. that we don't want to have in the house. <clears throat> because if we bring it in the house, it's gone. You, you were just like you. Yep. Well, I agree. That's why I say if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's a good saying. And, and it, you know, but I, I suppose there'd be some limits. There's some things I wouldn't eat if but yeah, do, you get, do you ever like have just maybe like a piece of fruit for dessert? Sometimes I'll have, yeah. we only have fresh bananas around the house. I told you. Well, I have sliced apples. Yeah, that's right. In you the do. Refrigerator and we'll get watermelon for the kids. Yeah. 
So I guess we So can. sometimes, but we don't eat it as dessert. We eat it as a snack yeah. during the day. Well, I just eat a lot of food. You know, like last night, I ate huge, two huge And there's one potatoes. in the refrigerator for you to have for lunch. For lunch, yeah. Yeah. So you don't, you know, do you guys ever do any sprouts? Mm -hmm. I do. Sometimes I make um, alfalfa sprouts and clover sprouts. She used to grow them. No. Let me show you what I'm eating for lunch, Dr. McDougal, because I have another show at 1.30. Do you think that's enough food? Oh, that's good. That's good. That's about <laughs> all we had for dinner last night. <laughs> One of them is the Hannah. And have you ever had these purple stokes? Yes. Those are really good. Yeah. P contrary to popular belief, I'm not just downing vegetables. I can assure you that most of my diet is starch. <laughs> I promise you that. Well, this has been so much fun. Dr. McDougal, what is next on our schedule? I know you've been- Oh, I'll tell you. You know, I was, uh, there, there are a couple of things I was thinking of. One of I was thinking- I'm you're going to have to excuse me. Yeah. Oh, Craig will be here any minute. All right, so well, you can tell I'll, I'll what finish you're going to do next. Thank you, Mary. We'll Bye, see you next, next time, okay. next month. You know, one thing I, I fear, uh, because I'm doing these lectures kind of as an ultimate in patient education, you know, I really am going to use these lectures when somebody comes to our clinic and we need to orient them to what I believe in terms of autoimmune disease or heart disease or cancer. They're to watch this, actually own it. So they can watch it a hundred times if they want so that people understand how I would care for them. And that's been the motivation for me to ask you to give me this time. But then again, I worry that I might be, I might be overextending my welcome. And I worry that uh, that people will get tired of listening to Dr. McDougall's how to treat, how to take care of people, medicine, especially when it doesn't apply to them. So I was thinking either I would tell you not to do what, let's not do one in two weeks, or or I was thinking together to put together one on my favorite mentors. There's a lecture that I give about uh, about the people who, uh, you know, I talked to you about Dr. Swank today. There's a lecture I give about Dennis Burkett, George McGovern, Walter Kempner, the people. Hmm? George McGovern? Well, he did the dietary goals. He's not really a mentor, as he know. But I talked about George McGovern in there. I also have a little, I have a little clip in it about uh, Barack Obama as a senator talking about being a vegan. Bet you'll never find that one. But I was going to play that one for you, or, or Michelle Obama being on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno, offering Jay Leno a vegan meal. I bet you won't find that one. But anyway, I could show that next time we get together uh, about my mentors, if you'd like. And it's then up again, to you. you can always come on or choose not to come on. But I don't think people are getting tired. Uh, well, that's because... what, that's what I fear, AJ. I don't want to. I don't want to overstand my welcome. And if people really want to hear uh, me lecture again, I know you have a lot of great guests. But yeah, I but do. you're you're our favorite. You're the only one that goes right. over three hours. You guys put in the chat if you'd like Dr. McDougall to come back and often, or if well, you're put tired in the chat of him. If you won't, don't want him to come back too. No, they say never get tired of the McDougalls. Right. So. Okay, well, then I'll be back in two weeks, and I'd like to give you the mentor talk. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Oh, it's it's a fun lecture. I don't I haven't given it in two or three years, and I really enjoy that talk. But do I was going to. Any of them have story. offspring? I mean, other do any of them have offspring? Who's that? My Any mentor? of the mentors, like did no. their, ch their children didn't? No, no, they don't. Well, they have children, but the children weren't too interested. Nathan Pritikin had Robert Pritikin, who was a good friend of mine, who ran the Pritikin Center for a while, but he runs a couple of hotels, owns a couple of hotels in New Mexico, I believe. Uh, Roy Swank, as far as I know, didn't have any kids. Walter Kepner was never married. And Dennis, uh, Dennis Burkett, I, let's see, I think I met a, his wife, yeah. I, I don't think he had any kids, no. All right, All right well, well, listen, we, we'll decide. Uh, I'll, plan on, I'll plan on being on the show in two weeks, and Great. If, you, if you get uh, opinions to the otherwise, I'll wait till the first Monday of the month or something. Great. We'll see you on March 7th, and thanks, everyone, for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Come back in 15 minutes when we have another show with Jill Nussenau. Well, I just want to make sure everybody knows how much I appreciate you as a host. I think you're doing a great job, AJ. So keep oh, it. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Love right. your shirt today. Take